Why, hello there. To receive each episode of Sacred Symbols three days earlier than the public, totally ad-free. To have your questions, comments, and concerns read on the air. To hear your name in the end credits, and to score other cool perks. Please consider supporting this show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Not only will your subscription net you benefits for Sacred Symbols and allow this show to continue into the future, but those benefits also carry over to other CLS shows too, including the video game-centric YouTube show SideQuest, the retro and nostalgia-themed podcast Knockback, and the eclectic interview series Fireside Chats. In other words, you're getting insane bang for your buck. Again, that's patreon.com slash Stand. Thank you for your kindness, generosity, and support. Without you, Sacred Symbols and CLS couldn't and wouldn't exist. Now, on to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is, I believe, episode 18. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined, as always, by my lovely co-host, Chris Raygun. Oh, boy, I'm here. Look at that. Whoa, PlayStation. How's life? How is your life? It's going pretty good. Yeah? Yeah, I'm knee-deep into Red Dead. And are you enjoying it? Yeah, I love it. It's great, isn't it? I'm, so, I'm surprised at how much I like it, honestly. It's a really special game from a lot of perspectives. I don't think it plays extraordinarily well, but... Yeah. It says a great deal about the game that, well, I don't really care about that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> because it does so many other things so well. Yeah. So I'm glad you're enjoying it. We'll get into that in a minute. But before we do, I want to just initiate anyone in case they haven't listened to our show before, Chris. Sacred Symbols is a PlayStation podcast. We put it up each week. It goes live on Tuesdays at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand, ad free and early. And then everyone else gets it in free feeds three days later on Fridays. And you can support us there, leave us nice reviews on iTunes, etc. We'd really love you to come support us on Patreon, though, no matter what level you can support us at. As I drive towards 5,000 subscribers on Patreon, I'd love to hit that number. Oh, wow. So I'd love for you guys to be a part of that. If you like this show or the other content I put out, if you have a few extra dollars to spare each month, and if you enjoy our wacky and zany antics, <laughs> then please consider joining us on Patreon. The big news, Chris. Yeah. Is that our Sacred Symbol show, along with Knockback and Fireside Chats, my other podcast, are on Spotify now. They're on Spotify. So I know a lot of people have been asking us about that. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that yesterday. You were like responding to something. I thought you were being sarcastic. Somebody was like, uh, hey, you should put the show on Spotify. And you were like, sure thing. Just did it. Yeah. And I was like, that's got to be like facetious. It did come off as flippant <laughs> for sure. But I actually meant it because what was interesting about that, Chris, is it used to be this thing. You had to like submit your feed and then they would approve it. But this person said something different to us in a tweet that they sent us, which was... It's easy now. Anyone can do it. Something like that. They're allowing everyone on. And I'm like, oh, so I just Googled around and it was true. It yeah. took two seconds for me to get all three shows on there. And voila, you can now listen to Sacred Symbols, etc. on Spotify. So I hope you guys enjoy that as well. But I agree. It was a very flippant answer. And I think a lot of people took it sarcastically. <laughs> By the way, I appreciated your tweet from the Halloween store. Oh, my God. With the Fortnite costumes? There was a whole aisle of Fortnite costumes, which is emblematic of exactly why I can't stand it. I just wanted to... I, I was just looking for props. Just nonsense. I, I don't think I would step foot in a Halloween store in the month of October. I don't know that. It's a daring and wily thing. I don't think I've done that since college. There no? Was a, there was a place in Boston where it was like a small costume store, and they like made you wait out in line, and oh, you had to like go weird. in, and as people left, they let you in, I guess because people maybe were stealing and stuff. And oh, weird. It I was just, a bit of a last-minute mm. thing. I, I went to go find like a Pip-Boy, and I did, somehow. I don't know how I that instinct was proven correct, but... Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I think I, have, I think I have one of those somewhere. Like a Pip-Boy? Yeah, like it was a special edition, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, well, now you have that, and you have to carry that around, and that shame with you as well for the I rest will. of your life. But I'm Gladly. glad that you... Is, was this for Halloween or is this... Because I saw you dressed up. Were you... Yeah, yeah. Am we, I imagining we, that? That you were dressed up in a vault outfit? Yeah, no. I had a, I had a vault costume. We, I, there were a couple of Halloween parties, obviously, that were around uh, where I live. A bunch of animator guys. So I had two parties to go to and I had two separate costumes. I had my Marty McFly getup and the Fallout jumpsuit that I was missing the Pip-Boy for. And I was like, ah, let me grab that one. Otherwise, you just look like a poor vault person. Yeah, otherwise it's more like a janitor kind yeah. of suit. You got robbed by rad roaches and... Yeah, you have exactly. nothing to show for your entire existence in that metal hulk under the ground. Now, Marty McFly is an interesting costume idea. This allows me to tease a future episode of Knockback that's coming out in just a few weeks. Knockback is my nostalgia and retro podcast I do with my brother, my other able co-host. And I got to be honest with you, I had only seen the first one, I think, in my life. I don't recall the second one that much, and I definitely never saw the third one. So I rented all three of them and watched them a few weeks ago. 
Really? Yeah. The second one kind of sucks. I like the second one. Really? A lot. I like yeah. the third one better. What? I like the third the one. Third a lot one's better. like the least <laughs> everyone's least favorite. Because it's it has Doc and it's about his love of a woman. And right. it's about also incredible paradoxes. Here's what bothers me about the third one, and then we won't go any further into this. They finally decide, it takes them three movies to decide that they should destroy this infernal machine that they've created that's creating paradoxes and massive problems on the timeline and they finally do it and then doc brown's stupid ass comes hurtling in on a fucking train he didn't learn anything at all he's going yeah. around with his shitty kids ruining timelines he doesn't give a fuck Reckless it's, it's an 80s whimsical trilogy <laughs> it's not the dark night you know you're not going and looking for like oh man whose life do i value more sophie's choice I was kind of hoping at the end, having definitely never seen Back to the Future 3 until two weeks ago, I was hoping that when they were crawling on the train that they were going to bring that woman who's married to Ted Danson. I can't think of her name. Mary Steenberger or whatever her name is. Why do you know that? Why do you know that? Because she plays, you know, in Curb Your Enthusiasm, it's often people oh, playing right, themselves. Right. And she plays herself as Ted Danson's wife in that show. Oh, I forgot that. So I was hoping that they were going to bring her into the future. And that, you know, Doc was going to have this inexplicable woman with him that yeah. he stole from another era. And maybe they get married and have children or something. But it didn't go that way at all. Yeah. It went in a different direction. No, 100%. I don't know what that was all about. That was, in, that was an incredible rant. Yeah. PlayStation podcast. <laughs> this podcast is about whatever I want it to be about. <laughs> Chris, for patrons on CLS, they might be interested to know, the last few months we've been putting up Sacred Symbols exclusives that won't be released to the public. So we did one all about you. And we did one with additional questions and stuff like that. And I just recorded an extra one called The Lost Letters because I have this guilt trip. I have this guilt weighing me down. About not getting to like questions? Exactly. So I went through old threads and I found 20 great questions that we never answered. And I answered them. And that's only available to patrons right now over at Collins Last Stand. So you can check that out. And a lot of people were missing you in that show. Ah, Indeed, I had to say over and over again because a lot of the letters were, hey, Colin and Chris. Oh, and as a joke, I kept saying Chris isn't here for every, you know, yeah, some people yeah. found it funny. I think some people found it annoying, but I thought it was fun. We'll get you involved in the next one. I'm a little wary of bothering you about doing too many. No, nah, don't worry about it, man. I enjoy your company and I enjoy the company of the audience as well. Speaking of new episodes or future episodes, people might recall that Chris and I did a Spider-Man centric episode. Chris still doesn't have the Spider-Man platinum, by the way. What? No, I got it. You got it? Yeah. Oh, I was making assumptions. Why didn't uh, you announce it? I, because I wanted to jumpstart you. I wanted to scare you here. Start I want to catch up. you off guard. Holy moly, you got it. I did it. Good for you. I Are kept you? it. I kept it secret. I even got all the trophies for the DLC. Oh, wow. Good mm -hmm. for you. So you're look at you. You're ahead of me. Yeah, look at that. Instantly. I'm full of shame now <laughs> that I made assumptions. You see, this is a great lesson for everyone out there. You never make assumptions. No, you never exactly. make assumptions. Is Chris ever going to get the platinum for another video game? <laughs> I don't know. We're going to find out. But he got his first platinum ever. Congratulations to you, Chris. I bring up the Spider-Man episode we did, which was a standalone episode that was available to everyone. First ad-free, obviously, and early on Patreon. But we're going to do that again for Red Dead Redemption 2, as we announced. Oh, yeah. And so I'm thinking we're going to record it a week from when we're recording this, and we'll roll it out next week. So I think we're going to roll it out something like November 8th for patrons, something like that. It'll give Chris and I enough time to experience the game a little bit more. I haven't gone back to it, you know, since I reviewed it because I moved directly on to Castlevania Requiem. And you can see my reviews for both Castlevania Requiem and Red Dead Redemption 2 on YouTube if you want. So that's something that we can look forward to as well. There's going to be a separate thread that goes up on Patreon to solicit Red Dead Redemption centric questions, most of which, most of, most of which can't speak. Mm -hmm. I ignored this week. So we're going to have a great second episode next week of the show Yeah, that you guys can look forward to for a really fantastic game. Brandon Reed wrote into us. Chris and said, hello, Colin and Chris, is there any chance that you guys could do a top 25 list for PS4 as a special episode? I think that's possible. Yeah. If not likely. And I think we could probably do multiple ones, maybe yeah. do yearly updates to them. But Chris, this brought up an interesting idea of what we could do in December, because I know that we need to see family and we need a little downtime and... You know, we're not going to be able to record each week, I don't think, in sequence, yeah. but I never want to... There's also not a lot happening exactly. in December, exactly. typically. But I don't want people to go a week without our show. I don't want people to go a week without hearing specifically your voice. I, I don't care if they hear my <laughs> voice, but if they go a week without hearing your voice, I'm going to be a little distressed and upset about that, and I think they will be too. So I had this idea that you and I can record a series of podcasts that will go out in December. We'll probably do like two, maybe three normal episodes that month. Yeah. And then we'll break off for a little while. But we can, we can record a 2019 preview episode so we can talk about our most anticipated games 
of the coming year. We can talk about our favorite games of this past year. So that's the second episode and then do maybe a reader centric thing. So maybe the top PS4 games or something like that is another episode we can throw in there. So the answer to your question, Brandon, is yes, eventually. But in December, we're going to be having a lot of interesting, you know, kind of one off, but also evergreen episodes that will, well, that will allow you to celebrate Jesus and celebrate all of those things. Just as you would. In All December. those December gods. The December pagan gods that for some reason Jesus just got wedged into. <laughs> Suddenly Jesus is born in December. Just gets shoehorned into this random month he has nothing to do with. He wasn't born, by the way, in December. This was a big point of what, contention. What was, he, what was he born? Like it's the summer or like March I think it was the I think the Bible, well, the New Testament, I think, indicates that he was born in the spring or the summer. I don't exactly know how that's indicated. I took at Northeastern a Bible class, a secular Bible class. It was a, like a rip down of the New Testament and who yeah. wrote it and why and stuff. And they were saying that every indication is that he was not born in December based on something to do with weather or where the stars were or right. the fucking wise men or I don't know. It probably Is there a line where Jesus is like, I'm a Libra or something? That could be. And they're like, whoa, that's amazing, Jesus. And here's your horoscope. Do you believe in horoscopes? <laughs> no. It's I, don't a know if, I don't even know if Libra is a summer or spring month. I just I'm, an, I'm a Libra. It's October. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 I think it means balance. Like our symbol is the scales. Oh, fuck. And we all know that I am incredibly imbalanced, so that can't possibly be true. But I also wanted to read something just nice, if I might, before we get into the news, Chris. Sure thing. Melissa Maxwell wrote into us and said, hey, guys, no question. Just wanted to say how much I appreciate your frank, thoughtful conversations when discussing news issues, etc. It's very refreshing to have a podcast with critical thought as opposed to the typical outrage narrative I see far too often. Thanks for all, all your hard work. Your 500 hour work weeks are really producing great stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melissa. And we get a, a lot of nice messages like that. I never want to skew negative. I always want to celebrate the positive on our show. And sometimes we just have to be honest and candid and frank as we've been with the Red Dead discussion, which, by the way, in terms of crunch and rock stars work ethic and all that kind of stuff, we're not talking about that this week. I'm yeah. sick of talking about it. It's, it's kind of a really beaten to death story. I'm going to beat myself to death if I have to continue <laughs> to talk about it. Although I will say this, just to be fair, because it, of timing of the last episode, there were a couple of pieces, I think one on Eurogamer, one on Kotaku that did come out that painted a picture of the good and bad at Rockstar. You guys should go inquire and read about those. I tweeted them out last week, but I don't want to harp on this much more. It's like what I said about PlayStation 5 the other day. Yeah. We'll get to it when yeah. it fucking matters again. Until then, everyone leave me alone. Now, Chris, you've been playing Red Dead Redemption 2. I want to save yeah. most of our thoughts for the specific podcast, but give me your overarching thoughts on what you think of it. It's strange. I feel like I don't typically care for most Rockstar games, even the ones that I appreciate. Like Grand Theft Auto 4 and 5, like I was never really that fond of, just because I always felt like the satirical, almost unbelievable world that it was set in conflicted really heavily with like the tedium of moving around in that game, like seeing animations through and like, hey, pressing triangle next to your car and like walking around it slowly and like these really wide turn radiuses. And it's like, this isn't as fun <laughs> as the world that you've set us up in. But in Red Dead, it's like the first time that I feel like that weird level of tedium or, or uh, attention to detail feels like it complements the grounded world that I'm in. So it feels more immersive and less tedious. And because of that, I like the horse mechanics. Like, feeding your horse, and I was like, ah, it's so stupid. And then I got really into it. I was like, oh, no, I got to make sure I feed my horse. And then my horse died, and I felt like a piece of crap. Yeah. I felt uh -oh. awful. I was like, oh, no, this is worse than, like, when a character dies in, like, a proper story campaign for most games to me. It's so funny you say that, Chris, because I made the assumption foolishly after 30, 35 hours with the game or whatever as I approached 40 hours that I couldn't kill my horse. And I, like, ran my horse in the trees at full speed accidentally. The thing was getting all beat up. And by the way, it was the mangy kind of horse you buy in the beginning as part of a mission. What'd you name him? Schmuckface. Schmuckface. Yeah, I wanted to name him Fuckface. I, I explained this a little bit in my review, but the game would not let me name him Fuckface, which I thought was inexplicably <laughs> weird. And someone else had made the point that they tried to name theirs Prickly Pete, which is a Seinfeld reference, and they wouldn't let him name Prickly Pete either. That's, which that's is really, really weird. strange. Yeah, I... I the assumption is with Red Dead Online, they want to like limit, I guess, what people are saying I, and naming I guess their horses. So, yeah. But <laughs> I thought my horse was kind of immortal. Like I was petting him constantly. I was cleaning him. I was feeding him. We had a great relationship with one another, actually a maxed out relationship with one another. So everyone else had these more impressive horses, but I stuck with my little mangy kind of dude. And then there was a train coming. And I'm like, I bet you I can jump that train, like the low, empty kind of train cars that have like cargo on them. <laughs> yeah. Missed the jump. The horse got run over and abolished, you know, demolished rather by this train. <laughs> abolished. And abolished from this earth. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I, I kind of went up to him expecting, you know how sometimes they stay down and then they kind of get back up and you have to feed him and pet him and maybe yeah, take yeah. a rest. He just stayed. He's dead. And then a pop-up happened and it's like your horse is dead. And I had to carry my saddle all the way back to a town to buy a new horse. And I was fucking horrified yeah, that right? schmuck face was no more. Yeah, I was you sad. Know? My uh, my poor first horse, Autismo. <laughs> yeah, that's Dude. a great name. <laughs> my new horse is Clay Aiken, and I'm really proud of him. <laughs> He's making the round. No, but I, I really like it. The detail in the game just feels next generation to me. It's just there's a lot of stuff, like even just like losing your hat in a bar fight and then going back like three missions later and being able to pick it up and like put it back on. It's like there's something like almost Dungeons and Dragons-esque about it. With the level of like interactivity you have right. with everybody and the fact that you can like diffuse situations. It's fun. It's cool. I it, like it. It's really, really great. I, I highly recommend it. And again, as Chris is saying, from a production value standpoint, from a intent standpoint, it seems like there's just so much happening in the world. It's not like one of these aimless like fallout games where, you know, a traveler with his, you know, beast of burden is just walking randomly through and you can buy things from him or whatever, and then you're going to mission points. So, like Shit just happens. People seem to be there, and then they're not there. The day-night cycle is relevant. The weather is relevant. I like how when you're dirty or clean and well, you know, clean cut, or your beard's all scraggly, people treat you differently. I like getting hand jobs and baths. I mean, that's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> you know, I haven't figured out how to bathe yet. Oh, really? No. Where's the bath? So you have to go to a saloon, and then you drop like twenty-five or fifty cents. It's and some of them are inns. And it will just say, like, take a bath. It will run a bath for you. You go into the back and you take a bath and then you can scrub yourself down. But you can pay extra money for a woman to come in and she helps you out. And she's clearly jerking you off. I mean, because she like puts her hand in the water and like yeah, rubs yeah. around a little bit. And, and then you could just dismiss her like, you know, like, all right, that's enough. And she's like, thank you. And like walks out. And I'm like, no, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And then I get out with a lot of vigor and I'm ready to go kill some people. That's my major problem with the game, though. Other than the controls, which I think are in, inartful compared to a lot of third-person action games, I don't like how I'm killing so many people. And I know that that's weird for people to say in a Rockstar game, in a Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead game, but it does conf it does conflict, rather, with the narrative that you're supposed to be peaceful, that you're kind of trying to lay low and hide with your people while you're waiting. I don't want to ruin yeah. the story, but you're kind of waiting for something to happen. And so I'm like, I wish that there were more artful ways for me to get out of this. I've killed probably 500 people already. <laughs> I'm one of the <laughs> all-time mass murderers in history. Yeah, there's. Um, I don't like. I don't like that dissonance. That's a rock star thing in general. Like a lot of rock star games are about like this guy who's like, I'm done with this life. But it's a it's Grand Theft Auto, so of course not. <laughs> like if anything, you're just getting started. So I feel like that's just been pretty consistent with Rockstar in general, that weird intonality. But it, it doesn't bother me as much here for some reason. I think just because, again, it just feels more... The sluggish controls almost make it feel suspenseful to me. Mm. It's kind of like a horror game, you know, like in Resident right. Evil where, like, you know... The tank control? Yeah, like, yeah. it's like it, it controls awfully, but it's it, it's like that for a pretty good reason. I don't know. I, I'm having a lot of fun with it, though. I, I love it. I am, too. I'm just... I'm overtly impressed with it like i just don't understand yeah. the level of design and thought that goes into a game like this also the performance is really great i don't want to say too much more i don't want to ruin our episode although we're gonna have plenty to say about that you know about the game driven by your guys comments when we start to solicit them although we did get one letter from a guy named drew rudden who wrote into us and said hey colin and chris what are your thoughts on the general consensus around red dead while the game is clearly critically acclaimed i feel like i'm reading a lot of responses from gamers complaining that the game is not like gta Considering the original game played very differently from GTA, I'm surprised there seems to be so much confusion surrounding this. Thanks for putting up all the great content. Well, the critical acclaim has been amazing. I had yeah. my review up go live at 4 a.m. at the embargo, I think last Thursday, and I read, I didn't really read anyone's reviews, but I looked at the scores, lots of 10s from IGN, etc. But yeah, people are complaining about the gameplay, and people liked my review because I think they felt like I wasn't afraid to say that there were significant problems with the game, in my opinion, too. But what do you think about the critical reception? Uh, clearly, commercially, it's being received very well. Yeah, I'm happy about it. it. It's a game that very clearly has a lot of love and effort put into it, and you can feel that when you're just playing it, even just looking at it. It's it's gorgeous. I do have issues with the gameplay, but I th again, I think it's one of those... I think even you said in your view, your review where it's like it does everything else so, so well that it like for me, it's almost like it doesn't even phase me at all. I'm over the moon about it. I, I think it's personally my game of the year, honestly, at this point. Right now, where I'm at, I'm enjoying it and i'm glad that it's getting the love it probably deserves especially after all this nonsense in the news right that's yeah. been kind of trying to take its thunder out uh, yeah irre irrelevant as it was and i don't see many people you know boycotting the game because of you know so-called disastrous uh 
development circumstances, which didn't seem to actually exist, especially if you read these pieces. Because even after the Kotaku piece came out, everyone's like, see? And I'm like, I read it, and I read it again, and I'm like, I don't feel like this is anything at all. But okay. I am thrilled that it's doing so well. And I agree with you. It does so much well that it seemed ironically nitpicky for me to pick on the gameplay. As, as weird as that is, because I know, it's so no. fundamental. It's like I'm really nitpicking on like my prompts not showing up or my guy kind of walking around weird and using auto-aim and stuff because it's so inexact. And in a normal game, I would be like, this game fucking sucks for yeah. a lot of different reasons. But man, it's an impressive thing. Is that the only game you've been playing over the last week? Yeah, I mean, I, I played a little bit of Castlevania, mm -hmm. but it's it's not my file. So, And I haven't played Symphony of the Night in the longest time so <laughs> my roommate gave me the control he was like in this later part and i was like i i do not remember i was getting thrashed so i was like i'm just gonna put this down for a little bit it's it's pretty much just been red dead right on chris of is of course referencing castlevania requiem which just came out last friday konami didn't end up sending me a code so i just went and bought it actually that night i pre-ordered it like an hour before so i had that little countdown clock it was very exciting yeah. and then it downloaded for people that don't know castlevania requiem is castlevania rondo of blood which was a pc engine slash turbo graphics 16 really turbo cd game that was only released in japan in 93 and its sequel symphony of the night which is widely considered the best castlevania game and widely considered one of the best games of all time in a nice little concise package and I beat Symphony of the Night last night. I'm a little bit of the way through Rondo of Blood. You guys can see my review on SideQuest's YouTube channel. What's amazing about it, and I'm sure you saw this, is how no frills it is. How compared to the Capcom collections for Mega Man and Street Fighter and all these things that are coming out where it's art, it's soundtracks, it's this beautiful package oh, yeah, put no, it's together. Just a straight up port. It's really less than nothing. And I'm really impressed with that. Like even the menu, I was showing Erin, who doesn't have a lot of insight in the games because she's not a, a gamer really. But I'm like, look at how bad this menu is where it, you select Symphony of the Night or Rondo of Blood. It looks like something I made in my Photoshop class in 2000 yeah, in high it school. Looks, it looks horrible. It looks like an alpha build of a menu. It's horrible. <laughs> it's really weird looking. But the games are fun. The trophies are there. I got the trophy for eating the peanut in Symphony of the Night. Yes, I did. And I am currently trying to get 200.6% in Castlevania Symphony of the Night. And I don't know what rooms I'm missing. I'm missing four rooms. I was this close to the TV screen last night like examining the maps and then I had like a laptop with the full map and I was trying to figure out what I was missing and I can't find it. So this morning I printed out the maps and I'm going to go and black out each one one by one until I find out what room I'm missing. This is probably going to be the next two days of my life. Oh my God. Just so everyone knows. Just so everyone understands. But if you've never played Symphony of the Night, highly recommended. Rondo of Blood is a pretty mystical Castlevania game because it's just not been Rondo accessible. Rondo is hard. Very hard. I can't do it. I can't do Rondo. Very old style Castlevania game predicated heavily in the Castlevania 3 spirit. I love how the first stage is Castlevania 2, one of the towns from Castlevania 2 just burning to the ground. Very cool. What I described in my review as incestuous, because Castlevania games are so incestuous with each other, with characters and enemies and settings and stuff, and it's just a huge love letter to gamers or Castlevania fans. And considering that it was a TurboGrafx-16 game, never released here, kind of this mystical quality to it. A lot of people haven't experienced it, so go check it out if you want. I recommend it. But it does have that Konami laziness <laughs> baked into it as well. Did you ever get around to seeing the uh, the Netflix show? I haven't, but I saw that you've gotten I, all the way through. I finished, yeah, all both seasons. It's sh shockingly good. Like, there's no reason why it should be as good as it is. It's probably the only good video game TV show slash film kind of thing that I've ever seen. I've heard great things. My brother likes it. I've heard really great things. I heard it's pretty short, too. So maybe it's, I'll just... It's really short. You can knock it out. The first season's an hour long. You can knock it out way quick. Interesting. It looks beautiful. I got to check it out. Brian H. wrote into us and said, Hey, Colin, as a fellow Castlevania fan, I was curious on what you would do if you were given the opportunity to make your own Castlevania game. Thanks for what you guys do. It gives me something to look forward to every week. Well, you know, Chris, Symphony of the Night's re-release reminds me that we really are desperate for Metroidvania-style Castlevania games, which we haven't gotten in 10 years. But with the glut of Metroidvania games coming out this year, I don't know that the... The resonance would be the same. And what's funny is that this game in particular, the Symphony of the Night re-release, would have popped so much more in a different year where there weren't yeah. so many of these games coming out. So I guess the other direction I would go in, as I've said before, is a 3D Bloodborne-style Castlevania game would be pretty cool. But Yeah, didn't they try that? Well, yeah, there are multiple 3D ones. The last ones were Mercury Steam's. Mercury Steam is a Spanish studio. They made Lords of Shadow and Lords of Shadow 2, which were 3D games. The first Lords of Shadow came out in 2010, I think, was pretty good. That had, like, Shadow of the Colossus-type mechanics in it, didn't it? It did. It was like, yeah. Yeah, you just, there were some big golem enemies that you would fight and climb. The first one was really actually a nice step, or a step in the right direction. It was interesting. The second one was really bad. And, obviously, 3D Castlevanias go all the way back to Castlevania 64, Castlevania yeah. Legacy of Darkness, Lament of Innocence, etc. So we've gotten a lot of those. I'll be interested to see what Konami does with Castlevania because Konami's going to Konami and 
usually that's not a good thing. Yeah. And Tony wrote in and said, hey, guys, loving the show. With games such as Symphony of the Night still garnering excitement over two decades after its original release, what current generation titles will we still be celebrating? 20 years from now. Is there any Symphony of the Night style game that's contemporary that in 20 years? So that would be in that would be in 2038. So in 2038, are there any like renowned classics? That came out maybe this year that we would still be talking about. Ooh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I can think of in the last maybe 10 years, I could see like I think Bioshock is a pretty seminal game. Like I can imagine like in 20 years, like seeing, I mean, I can't comprehend a remake of Bioshock, but I can imagine that being a game that we look back on as like a very f- phenomenal, like seminal kind of moment. But this year, I don't know, even God of War, as great as it is, maybe Red Dead, honestly. Yeah, it could be Red Dead. It could be Spider-Man. I mean, the problem I have with these 3D games as opposed to the 2D games is that they just don't age as well. Castlevania Symphony of the Night in my mind, I, mean, I just played it again and I was looking at it. I was even explaining it to Aaron why it's so beautiful and why it's so complicated to make games like that because of the pixel art and the animations and stuff. That game is beautiful and it's going to be beautiful in 20 years. And I don't know, as surprising as it sounds, I don't know if Red Dead Redemption 2 is going to be beautiful in 20 years. As photorealistic as it seems right now, I remember playing things like, you know, Red Faction and yeah. shit like that. And being yeah, like, no, wow, exactly. it's not going to get any better. Or, you know, Smuggler's Run where I'm like, it's not going to get any better than this. Yeah. And it looks like fucking garbage, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I don't know. I don't know. No, I, I, I agree. I, I definitely think they don't particularly age as well. I think even the original Red Dead Redemption looks pretty, still pretty good, honestly. Like, I think it holds up relatively well. It's still very clearly dated, but it's not quite as dated as, like, Red Dead Revolver, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is, like, very clearly, like, what is what is this? What is this Fortnite looking character design? Going? Yeah, Red Dead Revolver, for people that don't know, was the original Red Dead game. A lot of people think that that series started with Red Dead Redemption, but it didn't. Yeah, no. That's why I was surprised. Even though Red Dead Redemption and Red Dead Redemption 2 are connected to each other in an intimate way, so I understand why they did the sequel. I was excited when the game was being rumored. I'm like, are they going to call it Red Dead Revolution? Red Dead Renaissance? Yeah. Red Dead, you know. Red Dead Revival? Something. Yeah. Something with something. I'm still disappointed that they didn't, but yeah. I guess there's a name and you want to sell your games. And who am I to tell? You know, Rockstar had to sell a video yeah. game. Especially because Redemption was such a huge thing. It was. Like, Revolver just wasn't as nearly as acclaimed or, or huge. Chris, let's get into the news. Sure thing. The big piece of news this week actually just broke this morning. Yeah. And it's about PlayStation Classic. Number one, the PlayStation Classic's entire lineup of 20 games has been revealed. For the unfamiliar, PlayStation Classic is an NES Classic-like console that pledged to put some of the original PS1's most iconic games on it, selling it in a second, or I'm sorry, in a closed form factor at a discounted price. While PS Classic is indeed still coming on December 3rd and will indeed cost $99.99, here are the games it'll come packing in its Western markets. Battle Arena Toshin Den, Cool Borders 2, Destruction Derby, Final Fantasy VII, Grand Theft Auto, Intelligent Cube, Jumping Flash, Metal Gear Solid, Mr. Driller, Oddworld Abe's Odyssey, Persona, Rayman, Resident Evil Director's Cut, Ridge Racer Type 4, Super... I'm sorry, this says Super Street Fighter, but it's actually Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo, Siphon Filter, Tekken 3, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six, Twisted Metal, and Wild Arms. The Japanese version of PlayStation Classic has arguably a superior lineup. That lineup is... Ark the Lad, Ark the Lad 2, Armored Core, Battle Arena Toshin Den, Devil Dice, Final Fantasy VII, G. Darius, Gradius uh, Gaiden, Intelligent Cube, Jumping Flash, Metal Gear Solid, Mr. Driller, Parasite Eve, Persona, Resident Evil, Ridge Racer Type 4, Saga Frontier, Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo, Tekken 3, and Wild Arms. So there it is. Mm-hmm. Those are the 20 games coming with it. And we received a letter that I think will catalyze our conversation just nicely, Chris. Brent Linquist wrote in and said, hey, fellas. It looks like the full PlayStation Classic lineup was announced earlier this morning. Any thoughts on the group of games that will be included on the system? Obviously, there are too many great games on PS1 to include, but are there any in particular that you're surprised they excluded? Thanks for the show. Chris, what do you make of the lineup? I I think I'm mostly happy. I kind of prefer Tekken 2 to 3, but I understand why they went with 3. Just It is a far more... Modern is the wrong word, but far more like, you know, a better developed game, I guess. I'm sad to see Wipeout not there. I'm sad to see, like, Bloody Roar, even as niche as that game is. I'm sad to, that Soul Reaver isn't there, Legacy of Kain, because that's, like, a phenomenal game that nobody ever cares about. I'm happy with Metal Gear and Oddworld. They remastered Oddworld kind of recently with New and Tasty, and it just didn't quite feel right. So I'm happy it's like a more, there's a more classic version of that game. I'm still sad that there's no Ape Escape, and I know that there can't be Ape Escape because there's no analog sticks on the damn controller. And that really does kind of make me sad. I did a little breakdown on Twitter 
today to let people know where these games are coming from because you can tell who was working with them and who wasn't. Yeah. A lot of people were saying, where's Spyro? Where's Crash? Well, there's remasters. The remasters exist, but also there are no Activision games here. So that gets rid of them. It didn't seem like maybe they were interested in working. As far as I... All right, so, I mean, I'll give you guys a rundown. Battle Arena, Toshin Den is Sony published. Cool Borders 2 is Sony published. Destruction Derby is Sony published. Final Fantasy VII, Square Enix. Grand Theft Auto's publisher is defunct, so I don't know if Rockstar just made that possible themselves. Rockstar has shown a propensity of working with Sony with their classic games. Intelligent Cube is Sony published. Jumping Flash is Sony published. Metal Gear Solid is Konami published. Mr. Driller is a Namco game. Oddworld Abe's Odyssey, that publisher is defunct now, but I think Oddworld Inhabitants owns all the rights to it. Persona is Atlas. Rayman is Ubisoft. Resident Evil Director's Cut is Capcom. Ridge Racer Type 4 is Namco. Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo is Capcom. Siphon Filter is Sony. Tekken 3 is Namco. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six is Ubisoft. Twisted Metal is Sony. And Wild Arms is Sony. So a lot of Sony games, but people were kind of mystified by, well, if Sony is publishing this and using their own games, where's Legend of Dragoon? Why Twisted Metal 1? Yeah, that's a weird one. You know, there's some weird ones, but some people were like, where's Tony Hawk's Pro Sk Skater? And I'm like, well, Activision's not clearly involved in this, and there's probably also rights issues yeah, with music, the music, the music and licensing. the licenses in there. So there's a lot of issues. I got to say, when I first saw it this morning, I'm like, man, this lineup sucks. And then I kind of warmed up to it a little bit. Now, the Japanese one is definitely better. Ark the Lad and Ark the Lad 2 are role-playing games that Sony published. It would be nice to have those in there. Saga Frontier is a fucking horrendous JRPG by Square Enix that came out in early 1998. I don't know why anyone would be excited to play that game. The game sucks. But otherwise, I don't know. I am kind of hoping that it's a little easy to split open so people can put ROMs on it. Very similar to NES Classic and SNES Classic. This lines up much more with SNES Classic, where it has great games and duds, than the NES Classic, which I thought was consistently great. So yeah. that's kind of my thought on it. Yeah, I, I don't know why, like, Mr. Driller, Battle Arena, and Rainbow Six to me are ones that I'm like, why, why is that there? <laughs> yeah, Battle Arena Toshin Den was a launch, Western launch and bundled game with PS1, so there's a little bit of history there, but it's not considered a good game by almost anybody, so it is a weird one to include, and... Yeah, stuff like, I think Persona is probably actually the biggest release because the original Persona on PS1 is incredibly rare and incredibly expensive. So this is going to, first of all, demolish the aftermarket for Persona being yeah. sold on eBay and stuff, which is great because I think people are getting taken advantage of. Someone had tweeted out a sealed version of Persona going on eBay right now for 800 bucks. Nah, that's ridiculous. So there's cool stuff like that. Resident Evil Director's Cut is certainly superior to the original fat box Resident Evil game. Yeah. I think Rainbow Six is the one that people are pointing at as being the most inferior game. I think that's a bad port of a bad game. So that's another one where Ubisoft kind of just tossed them tossed, a bone. Yeah, well, like you can take Rayman, which is great, and you can also pop yeah. this bad boy into it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm happy to see Rayman there. I can't say enough about Wild Arms. Wild Arms is one of my favorite games of all time. I never played it. Great role play. Well, you're not going to like it, but it's a <laughs> it's a great Japanese role playing game set in a Western aesthetic, which is very weird and. What I love about it is that you play as the same three characters the entire game. You know, in Japanese role-playing games, usually people join the party, then you get a bunch of characters, and you have to kind of select who's going to be in your party and stuff. It's not like that in Wild Arms. That's what I always loved about it. You got to know the characters, and they stayed with you, and they got stronger, and you went through the story with them. So I highly recommend Wild Arms. But ninety nine ninety nine as well seems very expensive. Yeah, it's too much. Seems really expensive. So I'm not going to pre-order it. I'll reach out to Sony to see if they'll send us one so we can fuck around with it, but... I have no interest in owning this thing. And most of these can be purchased as PS1 classics. Although, as we know, you would need to play those on the PS3 or Vita. So there's that. Disappointment. I don't know if I would describe it like that, but... Underwhelming. Yeah. Underwhelming. There you go. And befuddlement as well. I think I would throw that in as well. Parasite Eve, which is fantastic. A fantastic Squaresoft game. Being included in the Japanese version, but not the English version. I'm like, why? Parasite Eve rules. Dude, that's a great game. Yeah. Really, really great game. There's there's a lot that's just like Medieval 2 would have been cool too. Oh, Medieval, you say? Yeah. Number two, we finally have news on the Medieval Remaster. Look at that segue, huh? That was perfect. That was announced last year at PSX for PlayStation 4. Well, it's Medieval Remake, actually, because like recent forays back into Crash Bandicoot and Spyro franchises, Medieval, which launched on PS1 in 1998, is being totally remade according to the PlayStation broadcast as relayed by IGN. Sony's Sean Layden came onto the show and said the following, quote, I think there has been some words that may, might sound alike but mean different things, like remake and remaster. This is a remake. We've taken the original game design and we've taken a lot of the key art, some of the other attributes of the game design and ethos, if you will, and we're working with a developer called Other Ocean Interactive, and they're remaking Medieval and that design, the original Medieval from PS1, end quote. He later added, quote, We're working with some of the talent that was originally associated with the title 20 years ago, so we're making sure that we're keeping it real, we're keeping it to the original intent of the creators, end quote. 
There's still no release date or timing, however, so we'll have to wait to see more. As for the studio Other Ocean Interactive, the team, according to Giant Bomb's developer archive, has studios in both Canada and California. They're one of the rare Canadian developers that seem to be in the maritime provinces, which is very interesting to me. And has worked on tons of games, seemingly smaller games or ports, including work on the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise, franchise for Konami. Additionally, a now-deleted tweet from voice actor Jason Wilson, who goes by J-Gun Online, indicates that he may be reprising his voice as Sir Daniel Fortescue in the remade game, though this hasn't yet been confirmed. The deleted tweet was a picture of him wearing a bucket on his head with the text, quote, the things that I do to prepare for some jobs, end quote. That, of course, is a reference to the rumors. I don't know if it's true that he wore a bucket over his head when he recorded his voice for the yeah. PS1 original, and that's how he got that kind of it's iconic like, it's, sound. It's like a muffled kind of like... <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So it sounds like he's on board. I would assume that this is going to be announced... You know, it would be interesting if this was actually a Game Awards announcement in December. That Maybe. I could see something like that. Sony never really has. They have shown The Last of Us there and stuff like that, but they never had huge pops there. And I don't know that they're going to start. I think they like to keep that in house. So I think Medieval is like a kind of a double A game that they can yeah, put out there for everyone. Yeah, it's it's weird to me, though, that they're doing it. They're making a remaster of one game. That's weird to me because there's only two. I feel like it would have been pretty cool to just do both of them. Did you play the PSP one, the launch game? There's a third no, one. No, I know I, there is a third but one. But what I'm asking you, because I'm not saying you're wrong, what I'm asking you is if that is a reimagining of one of the original two. Because I was never a medieval fan and I didn't play that one. No, I, I played a little bit of the PSP one. It wasn't, I don't recall it as, as a reimagining. It did feel like a new kind of game. But I think the first two are the ones that people think of when they think of medieval, medieval mm -hmm. one and two. But it's just strange because they have like they remastered all three Crash games, all three Spyro games, and then just one of the two medieval games. It just seems like a weird kind of decision. It is weird. I wonder if they're keeping it secret, keeping it secret, keeping it safe. That yeah. Maybe they're going to put the second one in there as well. Or maybe they're testing the waters. What I do wonder is people might remember, and I think you remember this, Chris, that a couple of years ago, footage that was very convincingly real of Sir Daniel Fortescue like walking through a graveyard for a few seconds was released. You, it I wasn't released, I, it leaked. I vaguely remember that, yeah. I think that this is this. And... I'm or that was this, and I'm wondering if that's true. It looked beautiful. It looked way too complicated for someone to fake. So we'll see. I'm definitely interested in it because I missed that game. Sir Daniel Fortescue, of course, his most famous appearance was in 2012's PlayStation All Stars Battle Royale. But it will be good to see him in another medieval game as well. That, that didn't annoy Chris as much as I hoped it would. Number three. <laughs> Spider-Man, the recent PlayStation 4 exclusive open world romp from Insomniac Games has officially sold huge. According to MPD, which tracks Western and particularly American sales, Spider-Man had the best first month of any PlayStation exclusive in the 24-year history of the brand spanning all six pieces of PlayStation hardware. That's insane. So let me reiterate, PS1, PS2, PS3, PS4, PSP, and Vita. The biggest exclusive launch month of any game by money made was Spider-Man on PS4. Not The Last of Us, not Uncharted, not God of War, nothing. That's the power of Spider-Man. Not Gran Turismo, yeah. Them marketing it as much as they did, I guess, paid off. If you take third-party games and non-exclusives into account, Spider-Man had the seventh strongest launch month in the history of the PlayStation brand. So that includes Grand Theft Auto games, Red Dead Redemption, you know, big, you know, Call of Duty. Spider-Man's number seven in terms of money made in its first month, which is amazing. So congratulations to Insomniac and congratulations to Sony for that. The full sales charts for the month of September 2018, which counts for both physical and digital sales, saw 15 PS4 games, including several exclusives in the top 20. NBA 2K19 was at number two, Assassin's Creed Odyssey at number three, FIFA 19 at number four, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider at number five. I was surprised to see it yeah. up, up so high. Other notable games include Dragon Quest XI, Echoes of an Elusive Age at number 11, which apparently sold twice as well as any Dragon Quest game in the history of the series in the West, which is fantastic news. Grand Theft Auto V at number 13, and Minecraft at number 20. So yes, Dragon Quest XI outsold Grand Theft Auto V for the month. <laughs> The top 10 best-selling games of 2018 so far across platforms are as follows in order. Far Cry 5, interesting. God of War, Spider-Man, Monster Hunter World, NBA 2K19, Madden NFL 19, Grand Theft Auto 5, Call of Duty World War II, Dragon Ball Fighters, and Mario Kart 8. The 10 best-selling games of the last 12 months cumulatively from September of 2017 through September of 2018 are in order. Call of Duty World War II, Super Mario Odyssey, Far Cry 5, Star Wars Battlefront 2, NBA 2K18, Assassin's Creed Origins, God of War, Spider-Man, Monster Hunter World, and NBA 2K19. So NBA 2K is selling really well as well. And finally, Chris, the best-selling PS4 games for the month on a SKU basis were in order. Spider-Man, NBA 2K19, FIFA 19, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Madden NFL 19, Dragon Quest 11, Echoes of an Elusive Age, Destiny 2, NHL 19, and WWE 2K19. And it's also worth noting, although I did not write it in our notes, Chris, that PlayStation 4 was very easily the best-selling console oh, yeah. of the month. That's to be expected. 
Straw Hat Ninja wrote in and said, Good day, gentlemen. With Spider-Man selling insanely well, even more than a lot of people expected, including me. How long do you think it will be before the announcement of a sequel? Hmm. I'd imagine they'd probably maybe do something about it when they announce the new hardware. Maybe like some kind of teaser mm. or something. Because I don't think it's coming in 2019. I don't think we're going to hear anything about it in 2019. Even 2020, I think, is a bit early. But I would expect, if anything, the launch year of the console, you would hear something about it. At least like some kind of teaser trailer, some vague, I don't know, like some CGI spider or some nonsense. Definitely the year after. I disagree with you a little bit. Yeah? Because I think I'm all confused now. With the, with the words that came out of Sony about PlayStation 4's life cycle and PlayStation 5 and the three-year thing that they said and all that, I'm all, I'm all out of sorts now because I was really anticipating what you're anticipating. And what might still be true because I liked your example of 2018 is one year, 2019 is one year, 2020 is one year, so it still indicates a 2020 fall release for PlayStation 5. I think you're probably right. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't be surprised if Sony came out at E3 with just a logo and said, obviously, yeah. we're making a sequel. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was a PlayStation 4 game. And I wouldn't be surprised if it came out in the fall of 2020 on PlayStation 4. I wouldn't be surprised if they turned it around really quick. Green light conversations have probably already happened. The game's probably already in pre-production, if not already being fully produced. And they have all the tools and assets on the hardware to, re to just make it and quickly iterate in 18 to 24 months. I know that that's easier said than done, but I think they can do it, especially if they rely on the same city and the same architecture, just putting in new kind of beats, new characters, new quests, yeah. stuff like that. It's dangerous, though, to do that, because if they don't iterate enough, then people aren't going to appreciate it enough. Yeah. And it might run it into the ground. So maybe you're right. Maybe they take their time. Maybe it's like a 2020, 2021 PlayStation 5 release. But I think that's waiting too long. I, I think that they have something now that they can extract more out of. Maybe, but they're also doing this DLC run where they're working a lot on the game that already exists. And how long is this DLC run going? Probably to the end of the year, I think. I think there's one October, November, December, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so that indicates to me that work on the game is really stopping at the beginning of 2019. So really, like, it feels like a sequel any time before 2020 seems, or even in 2020, I feel, like it's a, I feel like it's a bit too quick. I feel like people will be like, what? We just got this. They do definitely have something to gain from trying to get it out as quick as possible because that's just how kind of like the market works. But I also think they'd be kind of shooting themselves in the foot if they didn't take the time necessary to make something that lived up to the insane acclaim that this first iteration garnered. I think you're probably right. You don't want to Ubisoft it. You don't want to Assassin's creed eyes yeah. this because then people are going to start making fun of it like we make fun of Assassin's Creed, although the last couple of Assassin's Creed games apparently go in a much better direction. Yeah, they have options here, but again, I am just so out of sorts with what they're saying about or what they said about PlayStation 5 that I'm like, I don't really know what to believe anymore. And now that Days Gone was delayed and now we have assumptions that The Last of Us was going to come out in the summer and now... I don't know what the hell is going on. I'm going to just plant my foot where I was initially. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fair enough. I'm going to be stubborn about it. You don't have to take a circuitous route like I did through that conversation. <laughs> Tony Colton wrote into us and said, Hey, Colin and Chris, with Insomniac Spider-Man selling like gangbusters and sequel being a sure thing, how do you guys think they improve on the original to take it to the next level? What would you like to see above all else in the sequel? Aside from the obvious stuff, I think it would be really neat and cool to see proper co-op. I mean, spoilers. They're obviously building Miles to be another Spider-Man. I don't think they're going to kill Peter Parker to replace him with Miles. So it'd be cool to have... I don't know, even if it's just like some optional online two-player thing, because I, I don't think I've ever seen that. That's not a thing that's ever happened before, where you've had a multiplayer Spider-Man game. As weird as that sounds, I think it could be pretty fun. You could imagine like racing, like competitive like races. I think it could be fun. Yeah, you would want co-op. I do, yeah, yeah, I like co-op. I like playing games. I like experiencing things with my friends, yes. You know, Erin's going away to Massachusetts to see her family starting tomorrow for like a week or 10 days. Yeah. Colin's entering hyper hibernation mode when she's gone just, just <laughs> a, even a worse version of hibernation than i already find myself in listen all i'm saying is that's the only thing that they could do that would surprise me just because we haven't that's not something that we've had before ever and also like anything that they could do from now on is like i feel like it's expected like oh maybe the city's bigger maybe you have more burrows maybe there's like more intimate web swinging mechanics that are a bit more involved than just like holding the right trick. Maybe like all that stuff would be cool and expected, but none, none of it would shock me in the way that like, oh, hey, yeah, you could play with your friends as a uh, different Spider-Man. Like what? That's awesome. That could be fun. Yeah, it could be neat. I want literally intimate Spider-Man controls, like intimate. 
like, you, like bedroom <laughs> intimate Spider-Man control. I want to see what that man can do. Like Detroit become human. Like <laughs> every uh, shoulder and trigger button controls like his fingers and you have to do the, the web uh, hand motion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it could be in the bedroom. <laughs> Number four. Not surprisingly, there's much more than meets the eye with PSN name changes, which were confirmed several weeks ago. Oh, my God. While the audience at large has to wait until early 2019 to do it themselves, beta invites to change names have been going out, and the results, according to many sources, should be concerning. Sil- Silicon Era reports that Sony is now letting beta participants know that in addition to what we already knew, that many old games, particularly on PS3 and Vita, might have problems. <laughs> issues go far deeper. You may outright lose access to DLC, <laughs> in-game currency, and other paid add-ons to games you already own if you change your name. You may lose your save data, you may lose your leaderboard status, and you may lose progress towards trophies. The latter is important because some people are mistaking this as outright losing trophies, which isn't true as far as I can tell. It's losing progress towards trophies, which makes sense if changing names is also corrupting some save data. Finally, even if you change your name, some older games may just show your old name anyway. (laughs) Alex Barbosa wrote in and said, Colin and Chris... What are your thoughts on the repercussions of changing your PSN ID from losing save data to paid content? Should they even test this at all with so many risks? What a phenomenal... I I don't even know what to say. I'm I'm speechless, honestly. It's awesome. It's so Sony. It's so Sony. Not only did it take them almost a decade to do this, but then they roll it out and they're like, it doesn't really work. I mean, that's basically what they're saying. Yeah, basically. Everything from April 1st of 2018 onward will work fine, but... If you want to go play your DLC for an old game and you don't see it there anymore, well, that's because you changed your name. You know, if you were going in the cloud to get your save data, probably corrupted. I don't know. It's funny to say that this is funny to make fun of, I guess, is what I should say, Chris. It doesn't really matter to me. I'm not going back and playing DLC for a PlayStation 3 game from 2011. It's just the principle of the matter that I paid for that DLC and now I'm going to lose access to it forever. This is a total crapshoot situation and they must have bitten the bullet realizing that, you know, we've been running into this problem for years as we've been trying to figure this out. This is the way it is. And th- we're yeah. going to just do it, you know? Yeah. I feel like they were just waiting until there was enough distance from PlayStation three to be like, Hey, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal if you lose your stuff because that was five years ago. You know, I just think it's astonishing that such a simple thing is so laden with <laughs> just so, just so covered in bugs and, the fact that you could lose stuff that you paid for is astounding to me. It's awesome. Yeah, you lose your data, you lose your saves, you lose your leaderboard status, yeah, progress I'm, towards trophies. Like, I don't even have that much of, like, because I played a lot of PS3 early on on friends' consoles. So, like, the PS3 was a very, like, borrowed console for me. So, I don't have much to lose as far as that goes. But even even with that, I'd be like, I don't know if I want to change my name. I just don't feel like dealing with that, honestly. I don't uh, know if I'm going to change mine. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to when the time comes, I'm going to make a video of it. If I do, I'm going to put it, make a video and put it on YouTube because it's such a iconic moment in Colin Moriarty's history. Yeah, but I don't know if I'm going to do it just on principle. I, I want to see other people do it and just see what the <laughs> unknown consequences that reverberate through the PlayStation Network and what they are and what happens before I do it myself. But we'll see. I don't have that much self-control, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. At the very least, it's not like an insane amount of gl- like where <laughs> you change your name and then you, you can only play DVDs. <laughs> Number five, the PlayStation Hits lineup is expanding. For the uninitiated, PlayStation Hits is akin to the old lines of PS1, PS2, PS3, and PSB games that are established hits given special boxes and sold at a discount. So everyone knows what I'm talking about here. Seven new games have joined the lineup, and each of them will cost $19.99 beginning on November 2nd at both retail and digital, though you should be sure you're getting said deal before purchasing anything. The games joining the lineup are The Uncharted Collection, Until Dawn, Batman Arkham Knight, Need for Speed, Need for Speed Rivals, EA Sports UFC 2, Shadow of Mordor, Dying Light The Following, Lego Marvel Super Heroes, Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 2, Earth Defense Force 4.1, Mortal Kombat X. Is that X or 10? I think it's X. I think it's X. Injustice Gods Among Us, Dynasty Warriors 8 Extreme Edition, Battlefield Hardline, and Dragon Age Inquisition. Games that can already be had at this discounted price include Street Fighter V, Bloodborne, Ratchet & Clank, Drive Club, Infamous Second Son, Killzone Shadowfall, Little Big Planet 3, Project Cars, The Last of Us Remastered, Uncharted 4 Thief's End, Battlefield 4, Doom, yeah. Yakuza Kiwami, Yakuza 0, and Metal Gear Solid 5, The Phantom Pain. I'm surprised that Battlefield Hardline sold enough. <laughs> I, know, I guess the bar's not all that high. Yeah, the bar's probably not high. They might also have a deal with EA to just make things seem like they're selling better and just kind of selling through... <laughs> You know, old games or games that are kind of dead. Although people liked Hardline if they liked that, you know, Payday the Heist, which is a game I actually really enjoyed. Oh, Payday was fun. I played it alone. But that was kind of a total carbon copy of that game. And I always felt bad for that because I was like, oh, it's kind of like PUBG and 
Fortnite where I'm like, oh, someone stole your ID idea and now it's much bigger than it used to be. Yeah. But this is cool. If people are looking for discounted games, I know money's tight for a lot of you guys out there and you like to kind of save your money and, and pinch pennies and I don't blame you at all. So this is a really great collection of games that you can have for, you know, $20 each. I mean, for a $100 investment, you can get some pretty great games. You can get Bloodborne and Uncharted Collection and Uncharted 4 and Ratchet and Clank and, you know, good stuff. So yeah. I wanted to let you guys all know. It's a good little, uh, a good little treasure trove. Indeed. Number six, The Elder Scrolls Six, which was an inexplicably revealed for some reason at E3 this past year, <laughs> is a long ways off, like a really long ways, according to GameSpot. Matt Fuhrer, who is the director at ZeniMax Online Studios, told the website what we've already heard. Quote, the easiest thing is look at how it was announced. It was Starfield and then Elder Scrolls Six. You can go back and count the years between Bethesda Game Studios releases, and you'll get the idea that The Elder Scrolls Six is not coming anytime soon, end quote. But it's what he added later that's truly interesting. Quote, I don't even know what the world is going to be like when it comes out. There will be a different console generation by then, I'm sure. Who knows? But I know we're free and clear for a long time, end quote. On the other hand, Pete Hines further explained just why Bethesda opted to announce both Starfield and especially Elder Scrolls VI so early, considering it's completely uncharacteristic for the publisher. Quote, The Elder Scrolls VI is big and it's ambitious, but also ellipsis. The most important thing to underscore is that the timeline between products that you get from BGS is not any different than it has been historically just because we've talked about two games after Fallout 76. I try really hard to manage people's expectations. It's not like Fallout 76 this year, Starfield next year, and then TES 6 the year after. The timeline isn't any different. What's different is just trying to be transparent and say, don't freak out. The next thing we're doing is single player, and we are making The Elder Scrolls 6, end quote. He later added, quote, would it have been better if it was some years from now and we just go, surprise, we're making a game called Starfield. It's out X months later. Yeah, for sure. But at the same time, there is also value in every day between them. People are freaking out about us making Fallout 76 as an online only game as a service and that that's all they're ever going to make. Take a deep breath. You're going to be OK. We're going to make some stuff you're really going to love. End quote. Yeah. That's fucking interesting on many levels. I'm going to reiterate. He admits that it probably would have been better. Yeah. If they didn't do this. But he says that there's value in doing it the other way. But he ends by saying, we're going to make some stuff you're really going to love. In other words, what he's saying is that you're not going to love Fallout 76. And by <laughs> the way, the early impressions of Fallout 76 beta are not good. No, they're not. They're, <laughs> they're not doing particularly good. So under that, all of that, it does make some sense that they got ahead of this. But it makes it me wonder, why did you even make this game at all? You know, there are certain open world games that are exposing Bethesda and their work. Dying Light was one of them. Witcher 3 was one of them. Horizon was one of them. And Red Dead was one of them. And I was looking at screenshots and video of the beta from Fallout 76. And I was like, oh, no. Yeah. Like a lot of those early, that early footage, too, <laughs> looks like it's not even so that, so much that it looks bad. It's like the, the just the frame rate is choppy. And like that to me is like. A big thing. If I can't play it like a frame rate that's at least consistent, I don't care if it's 30, if it's like 60, I don't, I don't care about any of that. But the fact that I saw it jumping down to like single f digits frequently, I was like, what is this? My God. I mean, I'm, I shouldn't be surprised because it is a Bethesda game and they are particularly buggy. But like, wow. I wonder if this was a snafu. This, <laughs> this entire endeavor was a mistake because... They're not making a game for their core audience, and then they made themselves announce two games that are for their core audience that are years away just to ensure them that this seemingly waste of time in which Pete Hines, again, I just want to read the quote one more time. I love Pete. Great guy. Take a deep breath. You're going to be okay. We're going to make some stuff you're really going to love. He doesn't right. say anything about loving Fallout 76, and he says, but at the same time, there is also value in every day between then. People aren't freaking out about us making Fallout 76 as an online-only game. It's like, why'd you, why'd you make it? I can see why they made it, because like the, the premise of it is really great to me. That's one of those worlds where the world of Fallout in general has always been like this world that I've been very, very drawn to. Even if like, like Fallout 4, to me, like wasn't the best Fallout game I've ever played uh, by any stretch. But the retro futuristic style and like just the music that they use and like the art design of it always kind of draws me in regardless. So having that world be explorable with your friends seems like a really cool idea and it seems like a really good endeavor to go for. And I can understand why they would maybe want to ease expectations because a lot of times when a game comes out, the immediate assumption is everything that this studio makes going forward will be based on the progress that they've made with this thing. Like people were concerned with Mass Effect, right? Mass Effect Andromeda specifically because like if Mass Effect Andromeda is this, my God, 
the next Mass Effect is going to be bad because it's going to be based off this. But, like, the idea is, like, okay, well, hey, we'll put this experiment out that could be pretty worthwhile, this multiplayer Fallout kind of experience in this huge, immersive, like, kind of open world that we, we're used to making. But we also want to let people know that this is not the direction. This is, like, an experiment. I think that's more or less the mindset that they were in, at least from where I was standing. Probably. I think that from a marketing perspective and from a zeitgeist perspective, making an online Fallout game makes a lot of sense, but it forced them into these PR situations that are really unfortunate because I said it, I think, months ago, and I'm just going to keep reiterating it. Every time Pete Hines give an interview about anything now, it's going to be about Starfield and the Elder Scrolls 6. It's just so different than what they've ever done. They just set themselves up. I really do believe that if they can go back and do it differently, they would. I'm not saying that they wouldn't release Fallout 76. I think they would just be like, Just ignore all the drama, and we're not talking about the future right now. We're focusing on this game, and then maybe we talk about Starfield next year. It comes out the year after, and we talk about the Elder Scrolls far away. Of course you're going to make another Elder Scrolls game. Did anyone really think that they were going to abandon Skyrim, which has sold tens of millions of copies and is still being released on different platforms? That's true, but they also... Another thing to take into account is that they made Elder Scrolls online. Mm -hmm. That's true. And we haven't heard anything about a next Elder Scrolls game. That's a great point. They made Fallout 4, but then they made Fallout 76, and we haven't heard anything about the next Elder Scrolls game. So it's, there is a lot to consider. You're smarter I, than you look. I do, th- <laughs> I do think... Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was like... I, I just felt my health go all the way down. There. <laughs> it's a great point. <sighs> this whole situation really hinges on Fallout 76 being a good game, and it... I, I don't know, man. We could see. It might surprise us, but I'm not all that confident, and judging by how often they're talking about how it feels like they're almost excited to get past it i think they probably are yeah so i i mean because along with it comes a lot of just extra work that they, they, they experience with the elder scrolls online and they experience with some of their other online forays but games like this require beta testing they require more patching they require servers and server load tests and they require people paying attention to that shit on the back end as opposed to yeah. just focusing on the single player experience so I'll be super interested to see how it turns out. I think the game's going to sell just fine, but I wouldn't be surprised if the critical reception was tepid. And yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I hope it's good, especially because that's a game that I think deserves to be good. Like, a multiplayer Fallout game sounds awesome, and it, it would suck if it's not. I should also clarify, I said they made Elder Scrolls. I'm not sure if they made it. I think they, another studio made it, but they published it. The Elder Scrolls it. Online, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, ZeniMax Online, it's, it, I think. Yeah, it's not, it's they, not, the Bethes- it's not Bethesda proper, right. but... It's the last time we've heard of Bethesda. Right, right. I just wanted to clarify. It's Bethesda published, and we know exactly what you're saying, for sure. You're right. I think it's a studio in Texas that made the game. Yeah. Gavin wrote into us, Chris. Gavin with two Vs and a Y. Oh, uh, uh, mm -hmm, okay. It's a little complicated. Yeah, it's a bit much. Convoluted. Well, there you go. Hello, brothers. Colin, I know that you, like you, like myself, are a big fan of the Fallout series. I like three, but New Vegas might be my favorite game of all time. It's not my favorite game of all time, but New Vegas is definitely the best Fallout game. I feel like Bethesda really dropped the ball with Fallout 4. I was so disappointed I didn't even play more than a couple hours before I turned it off and discuss. Do you think we we will get another good Fallout game? So do you think that we'll get another core Fallout game? Because that's what's interesting about this. That's what's most interesting about this to me. They keep emphasizing, Chris, the timeline, right? You guys know how quickly we release games. We released Fallout 4 or Fallout 3 in 2008. We released Elder Scrolls in 2011. We released Fallout 4 in 2015. So we're going to release Starfield 2019, 2020. We're going to release Elder Scrolls 2022, 2023. Where does that leave Fallout? You know, and with Obsidian probably going to Microsoft now, Mm -hmm. we don't know if that's going to happen or not, but that's probably going to join the first party family, as you guys might know out there. Other kind of publisher or developers can make the game, but... Bethesda seems to not have a propensity of working with other developers. Like they used to work with Splash Damage and all these guys to publish their games. So... It does leave Fallout in a pretty sticky situation. That's if gonna if that's gonna remain internal. That's three games away, which is ten plus years from now. Yeah, <laughs> so um, that's pretty interesting. It, yeah, no, it, it might be a while. I mean, they are working with a bunch of different studios right now. I mean, obviously, like the Dishonored guys aren't doing anything, as far as I'm aware of. Rage is a thing <laughs> that, that a thing. may or may not do well. Maybe they'll get some of these studios to maybe take on that label. It's difficult to say. Because, again, they have laid out the timeline and we have no mention of Fallout. But timelines do change. Even things that are like in pen and paper, like contracts change. I remember the Destiny contract was that was leaked during that lawsuit was very, very different than what we ended up getting. Like it was a full year off, first off. So like things can change. I would imagine we'd probably find ourselves with another good Fallout game. Will we get another great Fallout game like New Vegas? I don't know. But like for what it's worth... 
I enjoyed Fallout 4. I had a lot of problems with it. I thought it was a good Fallout game. Not a great one. I just think everything they're doing now just looks incredibly aged. They were yeah. really exposed by The Witcher, especially. I really believe that. And I just need them to go away for a little while, I think, and refine and work on that engine. And I know that it's not a cautionary tale in parallel, but Telltale, which we talked about extensively in their demise, they fell apart because they refused to iterate. They refused to fix the things that were truly wrong. And they were outclassed and outshone by others that did it better, whether it was Quantic Dream, whether it was Don't Nod with the Life is Strange series. Like People just didn't want this garbage anymore from them <laughs> like yeah. they just didn't want it anymore you know and yeah sales precipitously fell and unfortunately a lot of innocent people lost their jobs as a result of bad business management and bad decision making i don't think anything like that's gonna happen with bethesda they're a massive publisher yeah. but they are being exposed within the role-playing genre by people that are just doing open worlds and action and all that way better and fallout 4 just i played it not too long ago it feels incredibly it, antiquated it's and, definitely yeah. yeah it feels like an old engine running on old but that's call of duty is running on what feels like the same engine that call of duty 4 ran on like that feels like an antiquated game to me like every time i play it i'm like why does it feel like there are no physics in this game <laughs> in this game it feels like everything is an animation path almost and that comes across in the game even the most recent one black ops 4 feels the same way but it's still selling a bunch. They have no reason to change their engine if it's not annoying their core group of fans. And if the core group of fans kind of sticks around, they've been buying Skyrim constantly. That's true. So, you know, it, it almost feels like as long as they can deliver something that's engaging or as engaging as some of the stuff they've made in the past, I think people will be willing to forgive their engine problems a little bit more than people were willing to forgive a studio like Telltale. And, and not to mention Telltale didn't own anything. That's true. That's another <laughs> They didn't own anything point. that they made. But that's a problem. Yeah, but they definitely do need to work on, especially because like Red Dead in, in particular, like has retroactively ruined a lot of open world games to me. I'm like, I don't I don't know how. Can you imagine being in person midway through or late in development of an open world game in another studio and you play Red Dead? Yeah. It, it, yeah. Oh, I would be pretty concerned. I, not that your game's necessarily going to do badly, but it's certainly going to be referenced not kindly in comparison and it just opens up that other question, which we will have in the future. We'll answer it, I think, more intimately in the future, which is like, why do we have so many open world games to begin with? I'm kind of getting a little sick of it, to be honest. And I love open world games, but we bring up Doom all the time and Wolfenstein and all these games that are yeah, great. Because they prove that you can still have a great linear experience right, that exactly. isn't, you know, that doesn't feel vast and empty. Exactly. Like my life. Number seven. <laughs> EA and DICE are officially delaying the much anticipated Battle Royale segment of Battlefield 5 until wow. 2019. Indeed, it may be as late as March of 2019 until the Battle Royale part of Battlefield 5 called Firestorm sees the light of day, according to a blog post on the official Battlefield website. With the game's initial delay, it was already supposed to be out by now and it was delayed until November. It appears that Battlefield 5 is coming in late and empty, though we'll see what we think about the final product when the time comes. Did this, you, oh, I'm sorry. This is insane. They're not in a good place. No, definitely not. Digitaco wrote in and said, hey, Colin and Chris, EA recently announced that Battlefield 5's Firestorm mode won't come out until 2019. They are also putting out extra single player content a mere two weeks after the game launches. This has me wondering if they had planned on having more content at launch, but didn't want to miss out on the holiday season with another delay. Are they actually just launching an unfinished game and then finishing it later and calling it free DLC? Thank you so much for an entertaining and insightful podcast. It's a safe bet, I think, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. They can't delay much, much further than this. They can't miss Black Friday. So... Yeah, I would assume that this game needs more time. This is probably would be this is the fucked up thing. This game would probably need to come out in February or March and it would get crushed just as bad as it's probably going to get crushed here. So I think they're just shitting and getting off the pot, to be perfectly honest. I think that's yeah, what they, have to they do. just want to get it out in time for the holidays. They they lost this one. This was like the year that obviously there was going to be somebody to like really get hit by all these like launches coming out at the same time, like Red Dead and Black Ops. Obviously, this was definitely the one that I think got hit the most. <laughs> especially considering it's not even finished there just seems to be a lot of drama around this game yeah pre-orders were apparently anecdotally very soft responses to the beta weren't incredibly kind it seems to be very me too in its battle royale mode and what it's trying to do which is a shame because battlefield one was really good and yeah. I, I wonder if the campaign and i suspect the campaign in battlefield five is going to be really good too i'm gonna to look forward to playing that i'm going to play it but it does seem incomplete and it does seem piecemeal and it makes you wonder with more time and more initiative and maybe if ea had the foresight which they couldn't have probably had 
to see what was going to happen with this game. If they could have really practiced a game as a platform, which is what I've always wanted them to do with one of their games, Madden or FIFA would be the ideal games to do it with. But something where it's like Battlefield 5 is like a platform or Battlefield's a platform. Here's the campaign. Here's the campaign DLC. Here's Firestorm. Here's online multiplayer and deathmatch. And you just buy them piecemeal as they're ready. I feel like that kind of future exists and will exist for these kinds of games. But I think Battlefield 5, I think it'll probably be, pro- be profitable because they're going to sell millions of copies of it. But it's going to be a far cry from, you know, Call of Duty numbers. And I just don't feel like people are really positive or excited about it at all. Yeah, like it's a shame to me. Like the, the, fact, the fact that they're putting out a uh, their Battle Royale mode in 2019 is like, whoa. <laughs> and it, it really sucks, especially because of all these games that are coming out that are like having Battle Royale like shoved into them. Battlefield's like the only one that I feel like actually kind of has that in its DNA already. Because Battlefield's already about these large sprawling maps and like running around for ages trying to find like a firefight. So I feel like it fits most with this thing and it's being delayed and it's like eh. not a good situation. Dice is not in good shape, by the way. Like there's just no way that I believe that that studio between Battlefront and Battlefield is in a good way. Their games are selling extraordinarily well. And I think that that's obscuring the critical reception that's not been great and kind of the baseline feeling of the player base that they're just not into it anymore and i think that they're getting away with it because of sales but i just think that that's going to dry up people are savvy gamers and consumers are savvy they're not going to keep taking a bite from this poison apple over and over again when they have all of this great produce that they could select from that's just as expensive or just as cheap depending on how you look at it and that delivers a quality experience for all the problems that people are having with black ops 4 for instance with the refresh rates and stuff like that the game's supposed to be pretty good and people are really enjoying it so it just seems to be a different thing. Like Call of Duty, everyone hates Call of Duty until it comes out, and then everyone loves it again. So It's insane that they managed to flub it so hard because like, they had a pretty good opportunity to take advantage of the fact that there was no campaign mode in the new Black Ops. That could have been a, you know, a strength for them. That like, hey, we have more to offer. But now like the one mode <laughs> that they had over it, you know, the Battle Royale thing, which would have put it as a, a bigger value than Black Ops with campaign, multiplayer, battle royale now is just not even finished that's unbelievable yeah it's really really it's, it's unbelievable. a shame honestly it's a shame because i i like battlefield way more than call of duty it's a shame too because making games is hard and i'm sure that they're struggling with it but ea is not doing them any favors over at dice oh yeah number eight bear with me on this one okay <laughs> it appears that sony may be kicking up the censorship when it comes to playstation 4 games During the last episode, we reported on word that the newest Senran Kagura game was delayed due to Sony requesting content be removed. According to website Gamatsu, the censorious movement may be going further, however. Website One Angry Gamer relayed tweets from Gamatsu noting that visual novel Nora to Oji to Naraneko Heart, which is on PS4, Vita, Switch, and PC, has been clearly censored on PS4, though not Vita since it came out earlier there. Whether or not this is a movement or simply a false alarm remains to be seen, however. So... For context, you guys can go look at screenshots. This is heavily Japanese and pretty inappropriate stuff, but you can see inappropriate stuff in the PS4 version that is obscured in some way that's not on Switch, PC, and Vita. But then there's more. Joey wrote into us and said, Hi, Colin and Chris. Thanks for answering my weeb question on Senran Kagura a couple weeks ago. This this time I would like to follow up on that. It seems even Japanese region games are, are needed to be submitted to Sony PlayStation in North America and follow their new stricter policies on sexual content in games. This recent move is unfair and unreasonable to Japanese publishers and developers. Some of the requirements are the game info needs to be in English and set up meetings around Pacific time. The new policy seems to be one f- size for all regions of PlayStation. Stupid new policy in my opinion since I don't remember when the HQ was in Japan that they enforce their rules on all PlayStation regions. It's like if they submit Doom into Japan region first to get the game released everywhere else. Do you guys think that PlayStation will lose Japanese publishers and developers and consumers to this new policy? And do you think Nintendo will take these games over? Because they seem to get games like Senran Kagura on their platform uncensored. This is a complicated issue because I am not deep into the visual novel and Japanese so-called weeb scene. Yeah, me neither. But there is a lot of drama if you guys are paying attention to this at all the last like week or 10 days because there was an interview given that Gamatsu had relayed for a visual novel where the developers are basically saying in it like, we're ready to go. The game's done. We signed some onerous contract with PlayStation, so we cannot put it anywhere else and they will not give us the okay to get it published. So we have no idea what we're supposed to do. And apparently things that were once okay are not okay anymore. Now, that is fine, I guess, if they've decided that they don't want to have these games on the platform anymore. And a lot of these games are inappropriate. 
that's of course in the eye of the beholder. But the point is, is that PlayStation created a significant niche for itself, not only on PS4, but on PSV and PS3 with these kinds of games. They dominate this shit. And yeah. with Steam coming up and getting a lot of this stuff now, whether it's Danganronpa and Zero Escape and all that kind of stuff, they're in serious danger of losing this audience that I'm sure is not in the millions, but that reliably buy these games and exceed and Axis Games and NIS and all these guys that sell their games to them and sell 50,000 copies of a game. They're thrilled to do that. But if they cut those sales in half, those games are not viable anymore on PlayStation platforms. So I'll be cover- I'll be rather monitoring this yeah. with a close, maybe pervy eye. <laughs> <laughs> to see what's happening with it. But you're very welcome. I, I'm happy to cover this. It's not in my wheelhouse, obviously, but this is a PlayStation podcast for all PlayStation gamers, including the weebs, including the weebs, including very much the weebs. <laughs> Chris, number nine is a wrap up. All right. Team Sonic Racing, which is under development at Sumo Digital under Sega's guidance, has been delayed and will now launch on PS4 and elsewhere on May 21st of 2019. 2D shooter Rim 9000 is coming to PS4 in January of 2019, and we'll have a limited run of physical copies released if you're interested in checking in on that. Alchemic JRPG Atelier Lulua, the Scion of Arlen, there are so many of these games, is coming to PS4 in the West in the spring of 2019. There must be 20 Atelier games. Really? Dude, there are so many of them. This is the first time I've heard of them. Yeah, it's usually Atelier name, the something of something, is the kind of... (laughs) It's a good naming convention. It's about alchemy and it's role playing and it's I played one of them for a little while and I'm like, oh no. Dennis Dyack, the mind behind the GameCube hit Eternal Darkness, the old Legacy of Cain franchise, which Ooh. we just brought up, and most recently the disappointing two human, which is not very recent, that's like ten years ago, has revealed his new game, a free to play action game called Dead House Sonata. Though it'll be coming to PS4, it doesn't yet have a release date. Nino Kuni 2's second piece of major DLC, The Lair of the Lost Lord, will launch sometime this winter and come packing new quest gear and more. Though it can be purchased alone, it will also come with the game's season pass, according to IGN. Classic FMV game Night Trap, which is already on PS4 as of 2017, will now be coming to Vita, too, according to website Push Square, along with a limited physical release for the most hardcore Vita fans. 2015, this is the weirdest one, 2015's Helldivers, which came to PS4, PS3, and Vita way back in 2015, oh, I already said that, so I guess it's the redundant, has randomly been given an update more than three years after launch, according to a posting on the European PlayStation blog. This update includes new difficulties, enemies, and more. It's weird. really weird. What? That game is... By the way, if you haven't played Helldivers, that game is fucking hardcore. That is one of the most hardcore, straight up hardcore games I've ever played before really? in my life. Yeah. I've, I feel like I have heard of it. It's a game where you can play with up to four players. You can play it by yourself. It's kind of third person twin stick shooting. Right. And you like land on different worlds and like eradicate the enemies and then get out. But like it's comically hard. Like there's friendly fire. So if you're playing with like a turret and you place the target and go in front of it, it will kill you. If you're playing with another player and they shoot you, you'll die. Like, it's really, really funny. I, I highly recommend people play it. It's really an interesting game. It's made by a studio called Arrowhead. I think they're over in Europe. So people can check that out. Push Square reports that a sequel to 2016's horror game Layer of Fear is getting a sequel, aptly named Layer of Fear 2, though little information is otherwise known about it right now. That's a great game. I must say that I was in a paid advertisement for that game back in the day, so you can take what I say with a grain of salt, but I actually really did like Whoa, it. Whoa, really? Yeah. Push Square also reports that puzzle game Slay Away Camp Butcher's Cut is Vita bound and will arrive on November 6th. Anime Fighter Jump Force, which was recently delayed, now has a release date of February 15th, 2019. Trine 4 has been confirmed on Twitter and will be coming to PlayStation 4 in 2019. Monster Hunting RPG God Eater 3 will be coming to Western PS4s on February 8th, 2019. And finally, Gamatsu reports that first person survival horror game Made of Skur is PlayStation 4 bound sometime in the third quarter of 2019. Lots of new games. Yeah, wow. I saw you eagerly making notes. Are you making notes about Helldivers? I don't know. I was looking for uh, I was looking for like screenshots of it because oh. I know that I've seen it before. And yeah, I have. I just got the name like completely mixed up. I remember when I saw it at Gamescom, I think, in 2014, and I was like, "Wow, this game is so fucking cool!" Because it just has no regard for the player at all, <laughs> and that's like part of like the right. badge of honor. It's like it has no regard for you. You know, I love that. I love how hard it is. And I love that since you play with other players, it reminds me a little bit of Overcooked where it's always the other person's fault. In yeah. my experience with Helldivers, I'm like, it's always someone else's fault that we're losing. And that game is really fun. But I think it's cool that they're still supporting it. And I do wonder if that indicates Helldivers is owned by Sony. That's a Sony owned IP. I wonder if it indicates that they're going to make a sequel. We'll see. Chris, should we get into the new game releases? Yes, let's go. Before we do, Alex Shanner wrote into us and said, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say that in the last two episodes, Chris has really been nailing the drop. Aww, and he says, much you. improved over the first few times he read them. I didn't think there was anything wrong with your readings the first few times. Well, we just kind of read them, like I think. Now you're showing a little bit of gusto. Yeah, we got to get some gusto in. I don't know if I have much gusto to give. No. Do you want to begin? Yeah, sure. 
Call of Cthulhu comes to PS4. Call of Cthulhu, the official video game inspired by Chaosium's classic pen and paper RPG, brings you deep into a world of creeping madness and shrouded old gods within Lovecraft's iconic universe. How do you say that word again? Cthulhu? Cthulhu? I, Cthul I, th I never know how to say it. Cthulhu is, is typically how it's pronounced, but I think it's Cthulhu. Cthulhu? I don't know. What, who C cares? C and T next to each other. Well, I wouldn't say that, that there's... What the fuck am I talking about? C and T are together all the time. Never mind. <laughs> Chronos Arc comes to PS4 and Vita at retail. And an aneurysm. Venture through puzzle fill. This entire show is and will always be yeah, it's just one <laughs> continual aneurysm. Venture through puzzle filled dungeons to bring the past back to the present. Don't miss out on Loka and his friend's grand adventure. Death Mark comes to PS4 and Vita as a Wednesday release. A strange rumor is spreading through the shadows of Tokyo's H-City. A mysterious disfigurement has been appearing on certain individuals. Anyone who receives the mark will rapidly die of unknown horrifying causes. I that's like an anime, isn't it, Death Mark? Is it about the notebook? No, that's, that's Death Note. Death Note, oh, okay. Yeah. This seems like maybe a ripoff of that. I mean, life. maybe. I like, the, I like the phrase, rapidly die. <laughs> Sounds a little violent. A little bit. Dream Daddy, Dad Rector's Cut comes to PS4. You and your daughter have just moved into the sleepy seaside town of Maple Bay, only to discover that everyone in your neighborhood is a single dateable dad. Will you go out with the teacher dad, goth dad, or any of the other cool dads? I, I like, want to like, check that out. I like this description. <laughs> it's a good one. I'm always looking to go out with some hot dads. Infinite Adventures comes to PS... I'm, not, I'm just not even going to address what you just said. <laughs> Infinite Adventures comes to PS4. Infinite Adventures is a dungeon-crawling RPG inspired by classic dungeon RPGs with fresh new mechanics for exploration, combat, and progression. You are the Traveler, a hero with a forgotten memory. You forget a memory, it's more just like an event at that point, isn't it? They just described every role-playing Yeah, I know. <laughs> you are a Traveler, a hero with a forgotten memory. That's literally 90% of every Japanese role-playing game I've ever played in my entire life. Someone's always forgetting something. Also, I doubt the, the adventure is infinite. Remember the game, I think it was Square Enix, it was an Xbox 360 exclusive, Infinite Undiscovery? Yeah. What the fuck did that mean? That name still bothers me 10 years later. <laughs> Who <laughs> named that? Just wake up in a cold sweat. Undiscovery? Shut up. Legends of Catalonia, the land of Barcelona, comes to PSVR. It's a Friday release. Enter an epic adventure, Traveler. By the way, I wasn't telling you to shut up. I was telling them to shut up. <laughs> Catalonia awaits you and you must help the knight Sant Jordi to recover the secrets of his lost diary. Join an adventure in the hands of illustrious travel companions in a world of dreams, legends, and fantasy. I'm not doing this one. This is Japanese. You got to get this one. All right. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do these Neko words. Para Volume 1 comes to PS4. It's a Friday release. Minaduki Cashew leaves a family-run Japanese sweet wagashi shop and opens his own cake shop, Le Soleil, as pâtissier. However, inside the luggage sent from the house was a mixture of human look-alike, Nekos, Chocola, and Vanilla. I don't even know what, like, that. I don't know what that means. That, I, I read it in my head and I was like, I, I'm going to have a panic attack. Why don't you read two in a row to make up I'll for do it. it, yeah, yeah. Paper Dolls comes to PSVR. Paper Dolls is a first-person VR horror game with a hint of Asian culture. <laughs> Explore an eerie ancient house with caution in search of your missing doubter. Only by conquering fear can you survive. But when you think it's over, the real story begins. Okay. The Quiet Man comes to PS4 as a Thursday release. Unraveling within a single night, players take the role of, a, of deaf protagonist Dane as he fights his way through a soundless world to discover the motives behind the kidnapping of a songstress from a mysterious masked man so that's a square enix game and that game actually sounds really cool yeah i want to check it out but i don't know when i'm gonna have the time the good news by the way as i interrupt our flow is i don't really have anything else i really want to play that's coming out this year like that i'm like dying to play which means i have about two months to catch up on everything yeah so it's kind of exciting so i think the quiet man will be one of those games redeemer enhanced edition comes to ps4 the stern Russian man Vasily is an ex-security officer of the world's largest weapons company. But when Vasily decides to leave this dirty business and escapes to an isolated monastery in the East, he becomes a wanted man. Well, they've asked for it. <laughs> I love this. Revenge of the Bird King comes to PS Vita. 50% bird, 50% man, 100% ridiculous. Plant seeds, grow guns, be the bird man you always wished you could be. A group of intergalactic superheroes has come to your world, bringing with them a tale of mystery and complete nonsense. I, I want like to look it. into that. I like how it's only on Vita. That's yeah. my favorite part about it. It's exclusive. 
Shadow of Loot Box comes to PS4. It's a Friday release. Hmm. Shadow of Loot Box is a first-person shooter about micropayments, loot boxes, cut content, and everything we love in modern video games. <laughs> if you always thought there was too few loot boxes in other games, this game is for you. <laughs> I like the, how snide that is. I know. It's very nice. I might check it out. Super Pixel Racers comes to PS4 as a Wednesday release. Super Pixel Racers is a fast-paced arcade racer with top-down 2D pixel graphics and a nostalgic 16-bit soundtrack. Race your way up the ranks in an expansive career mode with more than 200 races. That's a lot of races. That is quite a few. That's a lot of races. Super Volley Blast comes to PS4. It's a Thursday release. Super Volley Blast is a super fun over-the-top beach volleyball game. Have a blast in the singular Super Blast mode with a chicken ball, slippery ice floor, and other crazy stuff. You have never seen volley like this. I bet I haven't. Ah, oh, sweet. It's a Japanese one. Awesome. Oh, jeez. Taiko no Tatsujin Drum Session comes to PS4 as a Friday release. It's finally here. Taiko no Tatsujin for PS4. Over 70 songs featuring old favorites and brand new ones. All the best songs from the arcade in your home. New for PS4 friend session, guest session, ranked match, and more. This is something I don't. I'm not familiar with this game, but this got a PlayStation blog poster too in its development, so people do care about it. But I don't know anything about it. Yeah, I, 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 mostly because I'm not a huge fucking nerd. You I understand? Mean, what you I'm always say that, there? but like, I feel like it's a bit of a lie. It's a complete lie. It's actually a completely over the top lie. <laughs> I'm lying directly to your face when I say that, audience. <laughs> I'm lying at you, not even to you. Now, Chris, I say we finish with seven questions that I've selected carefully from the audience. Okay. Remember, you can submit your questions over at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. If you support us over there at the $2 level or higher every month, you can submit questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas. It's the only way to interact with our show. Otherwise, we ignore you completely. Kyle Tisdale wrote in and said, hey, guys, I wanted to hear your thoughts on getting games physically at midnight launches, like at GameStop. I just picked up Red Dead 2 at launch last night, and there was almost 100 people in line. It's something I love, and I have fond memories of getting games at launch in the past. If the digital age puts this to an end, would either of you miss it? I don't do that all that often anymore, but I do have, like, very fond memories of doing that. It's it's always a really fun experience to just kind of... It's almost like you're going out, and you're, like, you're hanging out with a bunch of strangers who are all excited about the same thing. And it's, like, it's a very positive environment that I do miss quite a bit. I think the last... Uh, midnight launch I went to was I think Destiny in twenty what year did that come? Twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. Yeah, and that I had a an absolute blast. I met like some people there that I still actually kind of talk to. I'll miss it, but at the same time I haven't wanted to do that in a long time. So I think it is something that I'm just gonna have to just look back fondly at. I don't think I've ever been to a midnight launch for anything in my life. Is that a huge surprise? A little bit. Mm. A little bit, only yeah. because you're, you know, heavily involved with games. Yeah, that's true. I've had the advantage for many years now of getting games early or sent to me. That's fair, yeah. And so that's a thing that I always try to talk about because I feel like it gives you a different perspective and a perspective that is a little detached, to be fair, from the consumer and the consumer experience. So that's like one of my Achilles heels, I think, for sure. Mm-hmm. And I try to be cognizant of that at all times. But I also always hated this conversation or this talking point of being part of the conversation, of having to play it immediately. If I have to wait for Amazon to send me the game or I buy it digitally and have to download or whatever, I just don't know that playing it immediately is this important thing to me. But I also say that from the perspective of of someone who's usually playing things weeks before they come out. So it's easy for me to kind of be flippant. Yeah, that's valid. It's sad that it's probably going to go the way of the dinosaur. But I mean, I'm hell, I'm, I'm just glad I got to experience it a couple times. They are super fun, especially like with a big release like this. Where everybody's just jazzed and it's like contagious excitement almost. Right, right. It's fun. See, the thing for me is that it requires me to be around people. That's true. And that's going to be a problem. (laughs) Tyler Malter wrote in and said, hello, PlayStation boys. I have a question I've been trying to find a good solution to. And hopefully you guys can help. What if any scoring system would you say is the best when reviewing games? If you had to score games, would you give them thumbs up or thumbs down? Five point scale or maybe a letter grade system? Thanks for making Tuesdays great again. I notoriously hate scores. That's the thing that I've been saying for years. When I was a senior editor at IGN, I tried hard to get us to get rid of scores. And I was the only person on the staff that was interested in doing that. Scores for websites are important because it gets them hits and it gets them views. And it allows them on Metacritic, so it makes them part of that conversation. When sites like Otaku, I think very boldly and very bravely, were like, we're not scoring games anymore. They did that at a cost because they're getting fewer views from people now because they don't score games and people have to read. And they're not on Metacritic. They're not on these aggregates. But I think scoring is incredibly reductive. And the way I always put it is this way. An art critic doesn't go into a museum and look at a painting and say, that's a 7.5. That Monet is an 8. It's like, well, what does that mean? I want to hear what you think of the painting. I don't need you to reduce it to some arbitrary score. Scoring rubrics, by the way, that are totally different depending on the website you're at. 
I gave one game of my life a 10 at IGN, The Last of Us, and there was a lot of confusion that that meant it was a perfect game. That doesn't mean that at all. You have to read the rubric. That might mean that on another site, though. So I don't think any of the scoring systems work. I think they're all dumb. If I did have to do one of them, I would do thumbs up or thumbs down. I think that that's about as far as I would go, and I think that that's the most useless or useful thing. But what's useful for me, Chris, is what's in the content of the review, what we're talking about. The reduction of the score means nothing to me at all. Yeah, I feel like the score almost contradicts the point of the article almost. Because there's a lot of people who write like, Call of Duty Black Ops 4 has a lot of problems. And then it's just like 9 out of 10. And it's like, what are you? what's happening? This is so much more confusing now that the score is here than it would have been with just the article. Right. Because now it's almost like there's like two separate opinions happening, even though it's the same. I don't like scores either. I, the, the one that I've thought was pretty okay was like, I, there's a couple of outlets that do this. I don't, even, I don't even know if it's outlets so much as it's just like smaller YouTube channels where they'll, they'll go like rent, pass, or buy, which I think is like a pretty, it's basically thumbs up and thumbs down with like a bit more of a neutral point. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I think scores in general are just kind of really pointless. I think they just cause problems. They just cause a lot of problems, a lot of confusion, at every level of game development yeah. and publishers. The notorious story about New Vegas, of course, I think is that Obsidian was guaranteed bonuses if their Metacritic score hit 85, but I think they were stuck at 84, so they just lost out on their bonuses. I'm like, that's totally fucking ridiculous. It's all based on these arbitrary boiling down of a person's thoughts. And I think that there's a lot of bravery and a lot of interesting forward thinking going on in places that refuse to do that. And some people complain in my comments on my reviews like where's the score and I'm like I don't score games I just talked for 10 minutes and you can figure out what I said because it's Castlevania Requiem is a great example I don't know what I would have done with that game Symphony of the Night is a 10 so the fact that you're able to play it on PlayStation 4 does that make the entire package a 10 but it's something that an intern made in maybe 15 minutes so I don't know (laughs) if this entire collection deserves it you know yeah it's hard for me to know so that's why I did the video review and I talked about the games individually and I talked about the package and you make a decision based on that I feel like there's got to be more interest from the consumer in getting deep into why games matter, why games are good or bad. And if that onus isn't on them, then I don't see how the onus can be on the other person to be like, well, here's the score and do what you want with it. doesn't really make any sense. Yeah. James Kinslow III wrote in and said, do you think Sony appreciates when a PS4 controller shows up in a porno? (laughs) Porn nowadays is about the scenario and one of the popular scenarios seems to be the girl playing a video game and getting distracted when a dick hits her in the face. Is any advertisement good advertisement? What do you think of that? Do I think they appreciate it? I don't think they pay much attention to it. It would be my honest answer. <laughs> I do love that where there's like... Uh, it is funny though. Yeah, like you see it in porn every once in a while. Controllers or... Girl, like there's one that I saw where I think it's just like a girl getting off as she plays Switch or something like that. Yeah. And I guess people are into this. Also, the thing that I've noticed that people have linked around even on Twitter is like there's a lot of like Overwatch and I think Fortnite now por- e- e- style porn. Yeah, there's, and there's a lot of Overwatch stuff. Now, I don't watch pornography, so right. I don't know anything about any of this. <laughs> right, of course. But I just have heard stories about it in the past. <laughs> Do I think that they appreciate it? No, I think it's funny. I think it also ages the porn, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of cool because we're going to have a repository of porn the likes of which the world can only imagine. In 100 years, porn from now that you think is hot is still going to be hot. And... It's going to have a PlayStation 4 controller in it or something like that. And I think yeah, that's kind of like, cool. whoa, look at that relic. Just like when you see porn that's in 4.3. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, what was this? Oh, look at that. When was this? Classic. Hot. Again, I don't. I, these are just stories that people have told me about porn. Andrew wrote in and said, Colin and Chris, is there a game out there or a game series that has been so massively loved by the gaming community that you just can't get into or don't understand the hype around? For me, it's the Uncharted series. And I'm not trying to be controversial to be controversial. I find the gameplay to be stale and mediocre at best while the story is meh. Well, I find you to be fucking stale and mediocre at best while you're meh, Andrew. I'm not trying to bring negativity to the podcast because I love The Last of Us and the Jack series. Thanks, friends. No, I'm only kidding, Andrew. You're fine. You're a beautiful I kind of feel the same way-ish about Uncharted for the most part. What is wrong with you people? You just kind of walk around and jump a little bit. You do. I mean, that's a good example of the core mechanics of the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uncharted 2, I think, is like objectively the best. Like 3 and 1 to me. Like 1 especially is kind of actually really not all that good at all i thought Interesting. back in the day i'm just but, gonna bite my tongue <laughs> well they got better as it went along and it is naughty dog so i mean but i think i've answered this before where it's just like i, I just i can't even begin to understand what the appeal of kingdom hearts is i can't figure it out for the life of me the series will for now be known only as kingdom farts on this podcast. Yes. We won't call it Kingdom Hearts. It's an accurate. I just don't. I Like, because I've never cared for Disney. Like, Disney to me was like, all right, I guess that's a thing. 
And I never really cared for anime or like Final Fantasy either. Outside of like maybe seven and six. So I, you're, I, you're really well out of your wheelhouse. There. I'm well out of my wheelhouse. Yeah. So like when I see this, it's people are like, oh, look at this great combination of two amazing things. And I'm like, this looks like a train crash to me. It's just like these two things that I don't care for at all just crashed into one another and became this hyper unlikable being. And I'm like, what is, <laughs> what am I looking at? I'm with you on Kingdom Hearts where I just don't get it. I see screenshots and video of it every once in a while. I really do believe sometimes that the entire <laughs> that the entire excitement around Kingdom Hearts can't possibly be real, you know? Yeah. I saw an image where it was like Hercules and his horse and like some Japanese guy <laughs> in like I don't know, Magic Mountain or something. Yeah, I don't know what the yeah. I don't understand and then what is. There's it's like, like a very realistic looking Jack Sparrow <laughs> standing next to them and it's like, "What <laughs> is this? I don't understand." I've only been disturbed that much. I mean, I'll tell you right now that the most disturbed I've ever been playing a game was when I played Mario Odyssey and there were humans in it. That and was, I was like, putting. I'm like, <laughs> that reminded me a lot of Sonic 06. Do you remember Sonic 06? I never played it, but I remember no, it. No, but you remember it. Yeah. I was, you were this just enormous cartoonish hedgehog surrounded by normal skinny people in suits. This is weird. This is just, un I was deeply unsettled by that. Oh, it's a deeply unsettling part of the game. Yeah. When but it's, it's also my favorite part of the game. New Donk City. Because it's city, it's Manhattan. <laughs> new, and it has that great musical section. New Donk City. Good Lord. But yeah, Kingdom Hearts is one of those series for me. I will say that Assassin's Creed was long in that series for me, and I really do think people stuck with that series far longer than Ubisoft deserved, but it seems like they're turning the corner with it, so I don't want to be too hard on them. But Assassin's Creed 3 through Syndicate, maybe, were supposed to be pretty bad. And I, as is the famous story of people that have been with me a long time, I used to talk so much shit about Assassin's Creed 2, how much I hated it, and people kept saying, like, you didn't play enough of it, you didn't play enough of it. So one weekend I platinumed it to be like, I've played it more than almost any of you. And I did it just to make a point for one episode of podcast. Did you still hate yeah. it? Oh, yeah, I hated it. It was terrible. I that game sucks. I liked Assassin's Creed, too. You, you would. I like Brotherhood more, though. You would. Hey, listen. Again, I don't know what that insult means. <laughs> you would. <laughs> I'm hungry. You would. You would be. Zachary Wellman. We have three questions left, Chris. Oh, wow. Zachary yeah. Wellman wrote into us and said, I know you guys might feel the need to play everything that comes out. There seems to be a need as a gamer to have an opinion about the newest game. At what point do you just say, screw it, I'm playing what I want, and I'll have an opinion on GameX when and if I get to it. I've been there for years. Personally. Yeah, I, I, I do think, though, like, if I only played what I wanted to play, I'd still be playing, like, the same games from, like, 2007. Sure, sure. I would still be like, I wonder if Bioshock is still exactly the same. <laughs> and then i just go back and play through Bioshock <laughs> again. Or, like, uh, you know, the classic Halos or, like, maybe some of the classic Quakes, Legacy of Kane, and stuff like that. So there is, like, a weird thing where it's like, the drive to kind of want to see what's out there, even though I might not personally be interested in it, has kind of allowed me to play more games and like more games. Like, I, I think personally, if I wasn't doing this show, I probably would have passed up on Red Dead for a while, honestly. Cowboys have never really been my thing at all. It's like my least favorite genre of anything. So the fact that I adore the new Red Dead is like speaks volumes, I think. And I probably would have missed out on it if I didn't have a reason to play it. Well, I don't want to put any pressure on you. Oh, no, it's good. But I guess I do play games to keep up with the conversation when I can, but I have no problem going back. I mean, I started this year playing all the way through Dying Light again, playing Bioshock 2 and platinuming it, playing and platinuming Bioshock Infinite. I think those were the first three games I played this year. And I always used to take a lot of issue with people telling me that I didn't play a lot of games. And I'm like, I think I play a lot of games, and I play the games through to completion usually, so get off my back. Yeah, right? Jeez. Like, I don't have anything else going on in my life. I really don't actually have much else going on in my life. <laughs> we have two more questions. Miles McLucas says, for Chris. Okay. You looked at me like as if that name wasn't real, and I believe that it probably isn't. When the inevitable Halo Battle Royale is made, will you try to recruit Tom Sweeney to your squad? Will you give up on life and throw a frag grenade at your feet instead? These are my only questions. P.S. Your last video was great, and your last video was really funny. Oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> it took ages. It took way longer than it probably should have. Was it ever remonetized? No, so it got remonetized, but then it got copyright struck. Oh, that's funny. So it's making money, but for, like, some random company. That sucks, dude. <laughs> it, it, yeah. That's it's, unbelievable. It's whatever. I fucking hate YouTube. It's a mess. It I'm really, as we said last week, I'm really seriously considering if this continues to just not using it anymore. To I, literally just doing podcasts. Yeah, like, I, I streamed a, uh, a couple days ago because I was just, like, annoyed. I, I liked it like YouTube. A lot. Yeah, it was on trending, which is like, wow. Are you kidding? It was very cathartic for me to watch. 
Yeah, but because everyone's suffering from the same problems, it's just a matter of like your scale. Like you have way more subscribers than I do, so you getting 150,000 views. Like if I got that on a video, I'd be thrilled. Yeah. But I have 67,000 subscribers. And so my videos sometimes are only getting 15 or 20,000 views, which is normal considering the, I guess, yeah. subscriber. But I'm getting all these messages from people being like, I'm not seeing your videos and I'm not yeah, getting it's anything. Been a th- for, I don't for, understand how this is possible. For people who might not know the, the full situation, lately there's been kind of a problem on YouTube where like a lot of content creators' numbers are down like... 40 to 50 percent the people's subscriber numbers are down also and a lot of people believe it has something to do with the fact that uh, google is shutting down google plus which is heavily integrated into youtube and it's been causing a lot of problems in the back end so uh, the general idea is just it, it just really sucks to suffer the consequences of a mistake that you didn't make and to have like basically how well you do be dictated by somebody who's not even directly involved with you or it's like like because I, I do pretty well on youtube still even with this ridiculous cut uh, but it's it's still frustrating because it's like, uh, well, it's not getting out to everybody. And most recently today or like last night, there's a glitch happening where people will try and watch videos and it'll say you haven't paid for this content because there's a, a way that you can rent movies on YouTube. And for some reason, that template is being applied to like massive swaths of videos. It's so broken. It's insane. Very some people's likes have gone down from like 40,000 likes to zero. A friend of mine, Leon, has zero likes on like a video that had 40,000. It's like, what's going on? It's really weird because you think this would be like an all hands on deck massive emergency for them to fix. If even one person isn't getting sub box, isn't getting their videos in their sub box, that's a huge problem. And now this is like a it's a joke. It's it's hilarious. It's on like it's an ongoing joke. Like it really makes me think about if YouTube is a place I really want to start keep putting content in, in the far flung future. I'll keep doing it for now, but I wouldn't be totally surprised if I folded SideQuest at some point and just started doing more podcasts because at the very least, as I've said on the show. We can control much better to a, to a certainty that you're going to get the show. Whether you listen to it or not is up to you, but it's going to pop up on yeah. iTunes. It's going to pop up on Spotify. And at least I have more agency and control over the content there. So, like, what if, you know, I'm not saying we were going to do this, but, like, instead of doing side quests, just do two sacred symbols a week. At least everyone knows that we're people are going to yeah. get them. No, yeah, exactly. As it's... opposed to me just putting something out there and hoping for the best. It's yeah. very frustrating, especially for smaller people like me that... You know, I don't have like a lot of reach and I really rely on them. So I just don't understand why it's not more of an urgent issue. And if it's not an urgent issue for them, then it shouldn't be an urgent issue for me to use their site. Yeah, exactly. So to answer your question, yes. (laughs) Anything to pull him off of Fortnite? I don't want to talk about Fortnite anymore. (laughs) Clark Petrie wrote into us with the last question. That was like really despondent. That was like surprisingly despondent. (laughs) Yeah, I felt like the hate like (laughs) radiating off of him. I didn't mean to. F- f- I'm I'm dire, but I didn't want to sound like that. Talk about this anymore. <laughs> Clark says, "Hey, fellas, love the show and the clear effort you put into making Tuesdays great again." Question on last week's episode, I really appreciated Colin's candor regarding getting games early and/or free. Well put and makes sense. My question is, if you feel not getting a game early limits your impact or influence on the conversation surrounding it, big releases certainly have that of the moment of zeitgeist and conversation. If you don't have the opportunity to prepare your thoughts and comments in advance of release, do you think that hurts you in comparison to outlets and personalities that do get the game early? I'd appreciate your thoughts on this as the business side of what you do fascinates me. Be well. Well, it is an interesting question and it's a it's a yes or no situation to me. I want to do what's best for the audience. I just said before that I don't feel the need to play a game immediately. And when, for instance, like we talked about how Ubisoft has kind of frozen us out, like they just ignore us, which is fine. That's their prerogative. And I don't know why they would do that. My suspicion is that it has to be politically driven. I don't know why else it would possibly be. But that's an assumption. And it doesn't really hurt my feelings that we're not going to get The Division 2 early or something like that, or that we didn't get Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I'll go buy it. I don't care. I'll buy it and play it along with the rest of you. But I don't like that it injures the audience's ability to garner as much or maximum value from our show when others are doing the same thing. So, yeah, it is a bit of an arms race because yeah. you have to stay current. Like the fact that I got access to Red Dead early because I have great relationships with folks at Rockstar and was able to get the game early. Unfortunately, I couldn't get Chris the game. You know, I, I signed an NDA. Usually it's what's called friend DA or like a, a, like it's just an email correspondence that kind of assumes that you're going to follow the embargo. And if you don't follow an embargo for company X, you're just never going to get anything from them again. That's what keeps you kind of in line. But with Rockstar's games and every so often you sign an NDA, you sign, it took two days for this process to go through and I got the game early. And so that wasn't something I was able to do for Chris because he doesn't yet have that relationship. I'm trying to shepherd those relationships for him so he can. And also trying to talk to developers and publishers on his behalf to get games that he's interested in. So it's more a matter for me, Chris, and I don't know if you agree of just getting 
and maximizing the value for the audience by talking as soon as possible about games. But on a personal level, I really don't care. It's not like a personal thing for me. If they were like, you know, like Konami didn't sell me, send me Castlevania, so I went and got it. I'm like, all right, it's not the end of the world. It didn't really hinder us from being able to talk about it. But it's really more on behalf of the audience than myself. I'm I'm older now. I'm not like racing to play everything anymore. And so I just want to make sure you guys and gals out there are just getting as much value from Sacred Symbols as possible. That's why my access and our access is important. Yeah. And no, I think I would echo that. I think it, any kind of content that's based on like current events needs to be out as swiftly as possible. And if it's not out as swiftly as possible, it needs to be on this next level of quality, which is kind of like the problem that my YouTube channel kind of faces where it's like I'm talking about current events, but I, there's no way that I can get a video of, you know, my standards edited and put out in a timely fashion. So my solution is just to like, okay, spend way more time on this. So it's at least entertaining retrospectively and like people can watch it over again. And like maybe that'll offset the fact that it doesn't necessarily matter that I wasn't the first to the topic. I mean, there's only so much you could do with that mindset in a podcast format. You know, it's like we just have to get to the current events as soon as we can. And, you know, it it does hinder us, I guess. But it's not like it's not a death knell or anything. Right. It's not what one might call a death mark or a death note. Yeah. (laughs) Depending on the game, depending on the manga. Yeah, to me, it's just a matter of trying to level with everyone. I always want to be open and honest and candid about what's going on on the business side. I know a lot of people find that fascinating. There's really, It's really not that fascinating. Yeah. There's just a lot of email correspondence, a lot of people sending codes back and forth, embargoing things, nothing untoward going on. If there ever anything was untoward going on, I would tell you. I certainly made a huge video, one of my most popular videos, about how Konami blacklisted me back in the day. So you damn well know I'm going to tell you if things go awry <laughs> because I don't really care anymore. I mean, it's... I'm independent and I have my own thing going on. But Chris, the other thing is, is that we have a, a large listenership. Sacred Symbols is a big podcast. There's, you know, more than 50,000 people that listen to this every week. And I would say that more than half of them are not going to even play Red Dead probably. And so we're also speaking to everyone. We're trying to democratize and liberalize kind of the way we speak about games and understanding that like we can put the Red Dead Redemption uh, spoiler cast out late, you know, because you're not going to be done with the game anyway. I had the game early and I'm not anywhere near done with it. So yeah, we try to play within those rules and those parameters as well. But I appreciate that you guys want to know more. If you have any other questions, you can always submit them and we'll happily answer them. But the reality is, is that we have great relationships with some publishers. We have no relationship with other publishers. And at least with one publisher, they don't like us very much, it seems like. So <laughs> yeah. that's like this cacophony, this mixture that's just going to continue to grow and swell and change as we go. And we're going to do our best to get early access on your guys' behalf for games that we're interested in mm-hmm. and go from there. So that's it. Chris, I think it's time we bid everyone to do. I think so. I think you're right. Appreciate your time. Of course. Hope you're doing well. Indeed, I'm doing quite well. Hope the roaches are well. They're still around. Yeah. Lesser numbers because I got these fancy traps oh. that I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with. So I haven't seen them around as much. But. Well, I'll remind you that multiple meteors and comets have hit the planet, and they also survived that. So it, they're yeah. not going anywhere. It's a game of endurance at this it point. It is. It's a game of attrition is what it really is, and they're going to outlive you. That's yeah. the unfortunate thing. And they're probably going to feast on our bodies, too. Ashes to ashes. You know roaches fly? I didn't know that. No, I don't, I don't know if Some I roaches that. fly. Oh, I yeah. found that out recently on a Twitch stream that I was doing. Somebody was like, did you know roaches fly? And I looked it up, and it's true. Interesting. Well, that's mm, terrifying. Yeah, no, it's I don't it's, need that. No, it's deeply off-putting. I just wanted to make sure you knew that, because I was well, I was deeply unsettled when I heard it. I'm glad I live like high, like high higher up where I don't have to deal with necessarily yet with the creepy crawlies. Like when I lived on the ground floor, second floor in San Francisco. Yeah, I'm on the first floor, so I have yeah. to deal with them. Oh, no. Yeah, You have to deal with like uh, pterodactyls or like airborne <laughs> creatures. Well, it often sounds like I live near the pier in Santa Monica and there's always helicopters going around. Yeah, because there's always people there's committing always crime. horrendous crime. It sounds like the fucking Saigon airlift outside like every day. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on around here? You know, there's like literally just shoppers flying around. It's, <laughs> the hell is going on here? You know, so there's we have our own problems here in Santa Monica. It's fair enough. All right, Chris. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate all of you guys out there for listening to us. Remember, you can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. Get every episode ad free and three days early. The ability to submit questions, comments, and concerns. Remember, there are exclusive episodes of Sacred Symbols, including one that just rolled out that will not be released to the public. Patreon only. But if you want to support us on free feeds, on iTunes, etc., please do leave us nice reviews. Please leave us nice reviews on iTunes, especially. It really does help us out algorithmically. Yeah, please. Remember, the show is on Spotify as well, and you guys can go download it there. I know a lot of you want it there. So hopefully that will improve our numbers even more as we continue to grow. Grow indeed into a sprouting, mighty oak tree. That's a nice it's a nice little visage, nice little image you painted. Thank you. The world tree, if we're going to talk about role-playing games. All role-playing games also have world trees in them. Yeah. So I don't know why. I can't really explain that. But we appreciate you. We thank you. We'll see you next time for more Sacred Symbols. Goodbye.
Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is fan-supported over at patreon.com slash Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon, and I want to thank you from the very bottom of my heart for your incredible kindness and generosity. Martin Beck, Fred Bentz, Michael Betts, Eric Bishop, David Blodel, Mark Boggio, Spencer Brand, Isaac Brewer, Lennon Brixey, Matthew Brousseau, Josh Bushing, Austin Bullock, Andrew Burkhart, Dylan Burns, Alex Cabrera, Brian Cacciatolo, Will Caldwell, Jason Camargo, Luis Cancato, William O'Carroll, Matthew Carter, William Cashel, Brian Chand, Travis Chandler, Sean Chandler, Kenneth Char, David Chestnut, Steve Clifford, Simon Conception Jr., Brad Cooley, Cutter Crow, Nick Cummings, Daniel Diamore, Daniel Delanicos, Travis Depew, Mitchell Durkash, David Ellis, Albert Escobar, Brian Fink, Joe Finelli, Eric Finkenbeiner, Stefano Fontana, Fodios Frangos, Connor Gazian, Alexander Gates, Michael Gates, Salem Ghanem El Ghanem, Daniel Glassford, Tyler Goodwin, David S. Graham, Josh Gravelick, Ryan Greenwood, Miranda Grubba, Andres Guzman, Tyler Harris, Asa Haas, Azan Isa Al Raisi, Josh Yeager, Paul Joyce, Greg Julius, Jeremy Key, John Klott, Kevin Komaki, Taylor Christian Laudrin, Christian Larson, Jackson Lastuka, Donald Laws, Joe Lawson, Don Q. Lee, Ashlyn Lee, Anthony Lencioni, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith Adrian Lewis, Chad Lewis, Mark Liberto, Aaron Litwiller, Louis Ray Loper, Josh M, Ryan T. Mandel, Joe McPartland, Wyatt McVeigh, Albert Miranda, Patrick Malloy, Betty Ann Moriarty, Abe Mukhtar, Brian Nietzsche, Josh Netzel, Adam Nix, Brian Ott, Jorge Palomino, Todd Paxson, Brendan Peavy, Marius Scarson Peterson, Enrique Perez, Eric A. Peterson, Jason Pettit, Lawrence F. Prokop, Eric R. Pryor, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Jonathan Rice, Toby D. Riemenschneider, Austin Riley, Ramon Rodriguez Jr., Petro Rose, A. G. Rowe, Matthew Savoy, John Schultz, Chris Schaefer, Toby Schutman, Riley Smith, Gerard Stuave, Stephen Summingut, Ahmad Tamar, Ben Thompson, Carl Tolman, Tam Tran, Dan Vale, Adam Van Curen, Oakley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Dade Michael, Edward Went, Mike Wayant, Tyler Woodall, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zaniga, Casual Misfits Gaming, Supershot ST, Mad Mock Media, Beric, Mubarak, Richter86, Dav9834, Chris, Wyatt Henry, Donk2015, and Random Guy Radio.